You're listening to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast, home of the two-hour deep dive interview with gold, platinum, and multi-platinum bands, including Stained, Blue Rodeo, The Arkells, Finger Eleven, Big Wreck, Moist, Bedouin Soundclash, I Mother Earth, Hill Scarlet, Neverending White Lights, Thornley, and many more. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast as well as share, comment, and like. Now let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We are joined by a very special guest. He achieved a level of mastery as the bass player for the Juno-nominated band Idol Sons, and he's gone on to become one of the most sought-after professionals in the live event industry as a guitar tech, as a backline tech, as a stage manager, and as a tour manager for some of the most iconic bands in Canadian music history, including Blue Rodeo, Matthew Good, The Arkells, and Finger Eleven. So welcome to the podcast, making his triumphant return, Bruce Nickel. <laughs> Bruce, how are you? And how good does it feel to have a few days at home after a lengthy tour with Theory of a Dead Man? Um, good, man. Um, you know, when we last spoke, things were kind of getting back to normal, quote unquote. And uh, I, I think it's pretty much full steam ahead for everyone in the industry right now. Maybe to a fault, but uh, it's it's definitely all happening. Do you say uh, to a fault because like every band in the world is on the road now and they're overdoing it to make up for lost time? Um, yeah, it's just just there's so much going on with so many artists and, you know, everyone's having a hard time finding staff and getting holds on venues that they like. And, you know, from the end user standpoint as a consumer and someone who loves music myself, it becomes hard to choose. Right. Like, which show do I go to? Because everybody is on tour yeah on top of bands being able to find venues that are available to book um and and finding professionals you know the lighting guys and the techs and all those guys on top of that it's it's hard for equipment rentals it's hard to find oh, vans yeah. accommodations there's gas prices there's a lot of stuff going on exactly i mean there's literally like if you want to get a, a bus that's like impossible to find a bus you know, yeah, van rentals for bands that that do the van thing, no way. You know, um, even like trailers, like tractor trailers, like they're impossible to find. Like nobody's got any inventory, so there's a lot of planning ahead and a lot of fingers being crossed right now. But you know, we always like to say these are good problems to have because that means everyone's busy. But there is such a thing as too busy. That's very true. I think you of all people know what it's like to be too busy. <laughs> I do all right. Um, I'm fortunate enough that that there are enough people out there that can stand me as a coworker that the phone does ring pretty consistently. The joke was that when the live event industry shut down completely at some points during the pandemic, the joke was that you were the only person still working uh, at that <laughs> point. So, uh, so I found that pretty, pretty funny. So for, for those that are tuning in for the Bruce Nichols fan, the Idol Suns fan, um, this, this is your, your return to the podcast. So you were on the podcast back in August yeah. of 2022. This is episode number 72 that you were on. We did a full two hour deep dive, your, your life, your career, your discography, all those things. So to the fans, you want to go back and check out this episode because we're doing something different today. Uh, this is a part of a new series called my five favorite albums. So we, we bring back the most popular musical guests in the podcast history, and we dive into their favorite albums of all time. So we're going to do about 30 minutes just catching up on what you've been up to since August and then we're going to dive into some incredible music and I wanted to point out that your episode uh, number 72 is the fourth most downloaded episode in the three-year history and this is number 99 so next next week is 100 so 100 episodes yours is the fourth most downloaded episode on Apple Spotify Google and the other artists in the top 10 have sold 5 million, 10 million, 15 million albums. Bruce, why do people love your episode so much? I lose sleep over this at night. I, uh, you know, I really don't know. Uh, I was kind of knocked over when you called me in the first place to come, to come out and, and talk. And then, uh, 
when I saw, you know, that it had a pretty favorable response, I was, you know, very, 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 obviously very pleased, but, you know, a little confused. Um, I don't really think of myself as being too big of a deal, but I guess I'm going to have to start getting a little more egocentric uh, in the near future. Um, I guess people like to see what happens uh, to the little guy on the other side of the curtain every once in a while. And, you know, I'm pretty fortunate. I've lived a, uh, I've lived a pretty joyous, you know, serendipity filled, exciting, you know, professional life. Um, I think if you were to hang out with me in my house for a day or two, you'd be like, wow, this guy is pretty boring. But, you know, I've been lucky. Uh, events have found me. I haven't found events. So I'm just extremely grateful and really totally grateful that you were uh, interested in what I have to say about records. I'd also like to book in that by saying I actually don't have five favorite records i have like a hundred favorite records and i i try as my mother would say you know not to play favorites so i picked five records that i thought were interesting and that spanned five different sort of moments in time in my life and in music so uh, i'm really excited to talk about that stuff and i'm excited to talk about you know all the shenanigans we've been up to since the, the last time we spoke yeah, I think I think people loved your episode because you were like the Wizard of Oz of the music industry on that episode where you were sharing uh, road stories and what it's like and the challenges. And you had worked with so many different artists that fans of those different bands got to hear a little bit of behind the scenes uh, for all those different artists as well. So I think that was a part of the appeal. Yeah, sounds good. There we go. And the, uh, the, the five favorite albums. So the disclaimer that you just gave that, you know, you have a hundred favorite albums, every single guest I've had. So I believe you're the sixth guest in this new series and all six of you have had a disclaimer up front saying, look, <laughs> you know, I have 10, 20, a hundred favorite albums. And depending on the day of the week that you asked me, you know, it ha I happened to yeah. have asked oh, you absolutely. on a certain day and those were your five choices, but uh, the very next day you would have given me five different ones. So to make life easier for you and all the other guests in this series, once we wrap up doing a deep dive on those five favorite albums, we're going to I'm going to give you a chance to share <laughs> your, your, um, how would you say it? Your, your additional favorite albums. So yeah. these are, are the, um, you know, just outside of the top five, or uh, I guess they're the honorable mention. So, yeah. okay. Uh, you know, and sometimes I, I would think people have one or two or three extra albums as, uh, as honorable mentions, but, you know, normally that that goes for like 10 minutes where, you know, the people people name 20 other albums, which is all good. So uh, we'll give you that freedom to just spout out everything that you love uh, at the end <laughs> of that. Uh, I wanted to start here with uh, one of our fan questions. So we have a oh, fan wow. question okay. sent in from Ross W. Sumner, who asks, you grew up in such a thriving local Burlington, Ontario music scene. What was your favorite album by a local band when you started playing music in Burlington? Wow, that's a that's a great question. Ross is essentially like my little brother. Um, we grew up on the same street, and he's right. The uh, what what we dubbed back then as the nine oh five scene, um, spawned a ton of bands. Um, especially in uh, punk rock, uh, emo, metal. Um, for example, where I went to school, the now closed Lester B. Pearson High School, um, alumnus include members of the Spoons, which is 80s, Sarah Harmer, early 90s, Finger 11, um, Idle Sons, uh, Walk Off the Earth went, Johnny from Walk Off the Earth went to Pearson. And, you know, the city of Burlington itself, you know, when Idle Sons was getting signed, there was like, Sorry, there were like four or five other bands from Burlington that also had major label record deals. And Burlington had a population of about 110,000 at the time. So at that time, when Idle Sons got signed to Atlantic, um, there's a band called Jersey, who was signed to EMI, a band called Left Pensy, who were signed to Arista, Silverstein, who were signed to um, a division of Warner, what became a division of Warner, which was Victory Records. Um, Another band called Summer Hollow, who were also on Victory, Grade, um, the Black Mariah. There was, you know, and these were bands that were, you know, touring the world. 
And, you know, at the local, at a more local level, there were literally like hundreds upon hundreds of bands that came out of that scene. And when I was in high school, everybody I knew was in a band. Like I didn't know anybody that wasn't in a band. And I don't, I don't think that uh, it's the same now because uh, the kids, kids don't want to have those kind of opportunities. There isn't like, you know, there was a guy who ran shows out of the YMCA in Burlington and a guy who ran shows out of the Polish hall and a guy who ran shows out of, you know, the scouts hall or whatever. Um, But getting back to the actual question, favorite local band record from that era. <laughs> Probably when Broken is Easily Fixed by Silverstein. That was, I thought the, those guys were really doing something interesting and different and you know um their second record or yeah discovering the waterfront which was I that think was the big breakthrough record, right that was the, came out the around the same time that the out of sons record came out and that's when i sort of got to know those guys and i was like i don't know if you guys know me but i'm in a band and you know we're doing this and that and i think you guys are awesome and you know fast forward 20 years later and now uh, you know i uh, i do work for those guys occasionally and you know, they were kind enough to call me in to work on their new, their last record um, that they recorded at uh, Jukasa. And, uh, you know, uh, the fact that they've been able to, you know, not only continue, but continuously grow their success really says something about, you know, the guys in the band and their abilities as musicians. But that one would probably be uh, one of the ones that I was definitely enamored with. Yeah, it's it's wild. So I believe discovering the waterfront was around 2003. So I had a girlfriend at yeah. the time that was obsessed. So back in 2003, I saw them in Montreal uh, at Metropolis, which is was I don't know if it's still a venue. But yeah, it's yeah. called a uh, uh, um, or Olympia de Montreal now. Okay. So I saw it was them Same with with a uh, Hawthorne Heights and Bayside way back in the day, and man those guys it's 20 years later and they're still like they, they're still on a massive like sold out tour they've sold over a million albums uh their singer i follow his podcast so it's lead singer yeah. syndrome and he he interviews other singers he just his, the most recent episode is him with gavin rossdale of bush like it's a huge podcast yeah. so yeah, josh is a great guy so i'm uh I, i'm a big fan of a uh, uh, silver silverstein so that's a, that's a good choice that's a good choice yeah. so your choice was the album uh before discovering the waterfront so yeah it's what sort is it? of uh their breakthrough record was uh it's called when broken is easily fixed okay that was sort of the one when we were starting to do the first idle sons record um the our sound man at the time was uh, also their sound guy a guy named sean palmer he had sent he was like oh you got to listen to this record man it's super duper cool that's awesome and so what? also to dovetail that ross himself was in a really good band <laughs> called armchair heroes where he played the drums I'm sure he's just dying for that shout out there you go you're uh, making dreams come true today let's let's talk about your your work with theory of a dead man so you're just coming off yeah. of not one not two but three tours with theory of a dead man across all different countries can you can you share your role in the theory of a dead man tour yeah so i've been with those guys um for the most part, full time since about 2016. Um, I've known the band guys since 2006. Um, and actually before that, when they were sort of coming at the end of their first album cycle, um, Idle Sons went and opened for them like probably like 10 or 15 times across Southern Ontario. And uh, I got to know uh, Dean and Dave a little bit and uh, we just kind of kept touch. And then uh in 2012, when I was working with the guys from Big Wreck, they did a tour with Theory of Dead Man and Big Wreck across Canada. And uh, Dave had hinted at, you know, like the idea of they might be looking for some people in the future. And, you know, I had made commitments to the Big Wreck guys and Finger Eleven and a few other bands and said, well, you know, I'm kind of committed right now, but, you know, please keep me in mind. And, you know, two years later in 2016, um, the guys called and said, Oh, you know, we'd love to give you, give you a chance to come out and work with us. And it's been uh, really great since then. Um, they're a band that likes to work and uh, they do a pretty decent amount of touring and they go some interesting places. And 
it's been uh it's been great it's uh a band that's been sort of on a steady slow kind of incline the whole time um when i started in 2016 they were in between records uh, 2017 was when the uh, record wake up call came out which was a, a huge success in the united states and europe um it ended up selling over uh, like a million records um they were nominated for a, an ama and we ended up taking that that album you know on tour to about 13 different countries and uh when that kind of settled they worked on the next record which was called uh wake up call was the one and uh say nothing was the next record which came out um exactly one week before covid so we were actually on tour um when the whole covid thing was starting and we closed the door of the truck on the 29th of february it was a leap year and then uh they didn't go back to work for like two years and we were lucky enough that uh because they're a mostly U.S.-based band, we were able to go down and work in the U.S. And we did a, a couple of pretty uh, hair-raising, you know, COVID-infused tours around America. Um, they went and recorded another record, which just came out um, last month, called Dinosaur, which we're, we're they're working in support of. So they were uh, Got invited by the folks in Hailstorm to come tour Australia and New Zealand with them at the end of January. So that's where we started. Um, luckily enough, there happens to be a little hamlet in the United States on the way called Hawaii. So we went and did a show in Hawaii, which is just the absolute worst way to start a tour. And then went from Hawaii to New Zealand, where a, right as we were landing in Auckland, um, the floods happened. So we ended up getting diverted and then stranded in Christchurch for five days. Which is definitely not a very difficult thing to have to endure. Um, Southern New Zealand in what is their summer is gorgeous. So we spent five days frolicking in the ocean and we went to the Antarctic Research Museum. and Tough break, oh, tough break. Yeah, just terrible and awaited our fate. And then uh, finally we were able to get uh, out to Australia. And then we did a, a bunch of shows in Australia where we actually played Joe's with the folks in a uh, hailstorm and it was, it was fantastic. After that, um, the band took, I think three days off. And then we started a U.S. tour in Nashville with a skillet that went for almost two months throughout the U S mostly in arenas and, you know, large skillet, stadiums. skillets, huge. So, yeah, you know, I had no idea. Um, John Cooper and Corey, his wife and the rest of the band, Seth and, Jen, they're all just really wonderful people. And the crew that we worked with, their touring crew and our touring crew really got along really well. And everybody had a really good time. The tour was extremely successful, which was always great to see. And then uh, the band took two weeks off. And then we started out with Disturbed in Canada and uh, went across Canada that just finished uh, like day before yesterday doing arenas with Disturbed, who were also super awesome people to work with. So it was all very fun and uh very uh very collaborative which is nice man those are those are all big bands big tours uh, does it does it make a big difference if it's just you know theory of a dead man and they're the headliner do things change versus you know there's four bands on the bill and they're just one does it i guess it would shorten their set time does it change anything yeah. technically for you as as the technically for me um when we go out as theory as a headliner, you know, I kind of, we kind of collectively get to, you know, we get to dictate how the day runs, you know, like, you know, how much space are we leaving and, you know, how much time are we taking up doing what we need to do where, you know, for example, when you're opening for another band and especially in arenas, there's a lot of hurrying up and then waiting, you know, so on Disturbed, we'd unload our truck at 1030 in the morning but we probably on, on most days we wouldn't see the stage until like two or three or four in the afternoon. So, you know, you're up early, you know, doing work. And then there's this huge kind of chunk of time where, you know, there's work to be done, but it might not be, you know, it might be like 30 minutes worth of work. And then, you know, you go have lunch and then, you know, 30 minutes worth of work and then you wait and then, 
you know, so a big part of, for me, working in those sort of that type of environment is, you know, looking at what I've got out with me, the gear and basically finding things to fix and trying to stay ahead of things versus being behind on things. Um, when you're headlining, you know, you sort of get to dictate what you do with your time. And when you're opening, you're trying to make the most of the time that you get. Um, as far as for other bands, you know, when our guys are headlining as a crew, we try and be as com accommodating as we can be, you know, like we try as much as we can to make sure there's room, you know, both off stage for their technicians and their equipment and obviously in the performance area. So, you know, because at the end of the day, the way that our band looks at it, the band that we work for is that, you know, when someone buys a ticket to a show, the show is everything right? Not just the 75 to 90 minutes that your artist might take up, you know? So you want to create an environment where everybody can do the best that they can and everyone can excel. And what would you say are the responsibilities as a guitar tech and a backline tech, which are the roles you're playing with your... <laughs> For me, it's, uh, it's funny. It's a job that can get excessively specific but uh, a big chunk of it, if we if we if we paint the barn with the very broadest of brushes, it's keep the gear working, right? Like I have a lot of friends who are um, bench techs who work in shops or have their own shops, and the level of work they produce is incredible when it comes to repair work, especially with like fit and finish. And you know, when you're on the road, it's like okay, you've got two hours to fix this thing and it doesn't have to look great, but it has to work and it has to work reliably. So it's kind of like two different sort of schools of thought. In some cases, the repair might be essentially the same, but in others, you know, like if you've got say a snapped headstock on a guitar, you know, when you're doing it in between load in and show time, you know, the methods you might use to achieve that may seem a little barbaric to a seasoned bench tech who's your like, resort to duct tape is, is yeah it, it's it's you know whatever it takes make it work whatever it takes make it work and you know sometimes that means swapping out parts for other parts that are maybe less less desirable but that's that's what i got my in the bench right now and all right let's go do it um a little more specifically in that camp. So I take care of two musicians, um, Dave Brenner and Tyler Connolly, who are the two guitarists. Um, so my job essentially is, is to make sure that all of the guitars that they play are, you know, in the best possible working order they can be in, which means like, you know, in tune, set up properly as to their specifications, you know, which is some something that some guys get hung up on is a guy might like a guitar to play a certain way, and it might not be the way that you like it to play. And, you know, you kind of have to get over your own hubris at times where you're like, well, that's dumb. Why do you do that? And it's like, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, it matters. You know, your job is to help others give their best performance. You know, so there's the guitars and then obviously the amplifiers and everything kind of in between, which is, you know, like pedal boards and cabling and then, um, you know, wireless and system distribution, how we're getting audio to front house, either via direct boxes or microphones and then sub snakes and which kind of a lot of times stuff kind of blurs between departments. So like with theory, like I patch all the guitar sub snakes, you know, I patch them myself because the box is right beside me. You know, it seems ignorant to, you know, ask the monitor engineer or the front of house engineer or the audio tech, like, Hey, can you do this thing that I can do right now in like one minute? Um, so there's a, a fair amount of responsibility. You know, when we look at the inventory of equipment, you know, like I'm responsible for its well being, which means, you know, like, also making sure that things are being packed, shipped, packaged in a manner where they're not going to break and that they're going to work reliably and consistently, which can be a loaded issue because at times, especially with amplifiers and um, equipment is the cost to package things properly where, you know, like I'm not just carrying around an amp head in a cardboard box. 
well, you know, a road case for an amp head is like a thousand dollars, which is a lot of money. You know, and then you know when you're using analog amplifiers like tube amps, well, okay, well, we need new power tubes or we need new preamp tubes or you know, and okay, well, maybe the artist might agree to okay, let let's purchase new power tubes. Well, you know, these ones cost this much and these ones cost this much, and you know, okay, how do we find a common ground on something that's going to keep the equipment reliable but not also bankrupt the artist? which is shockingly easy to do when it comes to gear. Hmm. So we're, we were talking about the longevity of Silverstein. Uh, yeah. Man, the longevity of Theory of a Dead Man. So I bought the debut album. This is like 2002 or something. Uh, if you remember 604 Records, so Chad Kroger of Nickelback, yeah, of 604 course. Records, they had all these incredible artists. And Theory of a Dead Man is the first artist ever signed to 604 Records to show kind of the history there. So 2002, that debut album comes out. I saw them way back then at the X in Ottawa. And then uh, because uh, of you being on tour with them, you guys came through Ottawa. You were at the Bronson Center recently uh, because of your hospitality. Uh, you gave me the VIP access at uh, the Bronson Center. I came out. I brought a, a massive Theory of a Dead Man fan with me, and I was able to see the um, the progression of the band from 2002 until just a few weeks ago. And I have to say that, man, the the production quality in the live show of Theory of Dead Man is is next level so i remember seeing them way back then and it was just just the band playing on stage just instruments plugged in they played and that was it and they were good but man the the lights and the sound and the performance it was the most like arena feel i've i've experienced at the bronson center which is an intimate <laughs> venue so do you have do you have any comments on uh the the professional quality of that live show um well there's two things one we dumped a bunch of gear into there that we have been using in arenas for the last six months and two um the band kind of gets ignored in canada um they do the majority of their business in the united states and have probably since their second record so a lot of times they'll come up here and i'll have you know friends or acquaintances or business associates come out and see a show and be like whoa like wow, that's way more than I thought it would be. It's mostly because down in the U.S., there's so much competition. You can't just get up there and play. You know, I mean, this theory of a dead man is, you know, in the United States, they're competing with, you know, bands like Hailstorm and Shine Down, And there has to be a level of production that, you know, for a concert goer, is going to say, well, I spent 45 or $50 to see the show. I need to get my money's worth. Um, as far as the, uh, the, the show itself, um, the band has sought out and done a really good job in retaining some really high level professionals on the crew. I'm kind of like the loser of the bunch. <laughs> um, our stage manager, Zach came from black keys. Um, our lighting guy, Jay came from imagine dragons and uh, one Republic. You have Andy DeVoe. Andy DeVoe, our audio engineer and tour manager, who is, you know, just an absolute legend. And he, you know, he does bands like Megadeth. And we worked together on the Hunter Brothers. He was with Marianas Trench um, when they had their 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 breakthrough record. Um, our, our team assistant, Joe Miller, comes from, also comes from the Hailstorm and Chevelle. And, you know, all these guys come from these big productions and big bands and you know they've all stuck around um we've had kind of a rotating door of modern engineers but sean Schul, mike roland who does daniel caesar um david longgrass who does three days grace and uh alex ginchero who comes from cirque du soleil like all these guys are you know top level professionals and they all like coming back to work with this band because everybody gets along really well and the band guys are really great to work with you know everybody has good days and bad days but for the most part 99.9 percent .9 of the times it's mostly just us all you know goofing around laughing and having a good time and doing the best job we can to provide a platform for these four guys to go and do the best job they can and that's 
kind of how I view the business in a nutshell. You know, once once you get on the other side of being a performer, you know, your job is, you know, sort of like you're a confidant, you're a psychiatrist, at times you're a magician, you know, you're also Mr. Belvedere, like you want, your, your job is to create an environment that makes the band want to play their best and be their best, which includes both the equipment side and the psychological side. Which, when, you know, when it's 12 dudes in a steel tube can be not always easy. Uh, yeah, when when the first, when Theory of a Dead Man kicked into their very first song at the Ottawa show, I was blown away. Just the, the you know, the lights went down and then there was all the lights from behind shooting out. There was there was smoke. The sound quality was incredible. The song itself that they chose to open with the performance, you know, the, the guitars were so clean and the vocals, like just everything to the point where, you know, I, I, all I do is go to concerts, right? So it's like, I have reference reference points and I was so blown away by just the very start that I, I took a video and sent it to a friend and I'm like, holy shit, like, look at the, look at the quality of this uh, right off the bat. So I just want to give you guys that compliment. And uh, what was awesome is the standstills open that show. So it was cool to see uh, Johnny and Brendan and, and Renee there. Yeah. And, and did you, did you hear about the van incident from that? Oh night? yeah. Do you yeah. want to share oh, yeah. that with our listeners that aren't aware of what happened? Yeah, of course. Crazy. Um, first and foremost, the standstills will always have like a really strong kind of place in my heart and in the hearts of probably every crew guy in Canada. Um, they are, work so hard. Um, they they always have a great attitude when they come in to do a show. You know, they've kind of had a, a bunch of different guys come in and play bass at different times. Uh, Chuck Daly, uh, Joe Barlow, and now Brendan McMillan, who goes back with me all the way to – the very, very beginning of the My Darkest Days era, because My Darkest Days and Idle Sons used to play together all the time. So I'm always super thrilled to see Brendan out there playing. So, yeah, they came in to do the show with us in Ottawa, and then were scheduled to come play the show with Theory of a Dead Man in Thunder Bay. And, you know, you're a native to the Ottawa region. Um, You know, the drive from Ottawa to Thunder Bay is long and arduous at the best of times and outright life-threatening at the worst of times and you were doing it that night after the show weren't you um we had a day in between but still like we left after the show and made it as far as Sault Ste. Marie and I think they left after the show and probably got within the ballpark and then you know you take the afternoon off you get some sleep and then you go you, you keep trucking so they were just about an hour outside of Wawa, which also to kind of give you a frame of reference, uh, Ottawa to Thunder Bay is like a 20 hour drive, you know, and um, the highway, um, Highway 12, Highway 69, Highway 17 is essentially a two lane road the whole way. It's it's not like being on the QEW or the 401, you know, it's a single lane, twisting, turning, curvy dark poorly lit you know badly maintained country road that basically connects ontario to manitoba and in the winter it's very dangerous to drive on especially highway 17 which goes around the lakehead um, around lake superior from sault st marie to thunder bay um, that's about 600 kilometers that goes around lake superior in the winter it gets basically snowed out almost on a weekly basis but in the spring and summer, it can be a very pleasant drive, except for one thing, which is wildlife. Lots and lots of wildlife. So they were coming up around a corner, and unfortunately for them, a moose decided that he also wanted to cross the street, which if you've seen how big a moose really is in real life, a, a full-grown adult moose can take out a tractor trailer without much difficulty. So, unfortunately, they came up around the corner only to discover a moose having breakfast on the middle of the road. And, you know, nothing you can do, you know, especially in a van and trailer. Anybody who's ever had to drive a van and trailer full of band gear knows that, like, there's no swerving, you know. You kind of just grip your hands and 
cross your fingers. And, you know, um, I think it was Brendan who was driving and he was able to kind of inform everybody what was about to happen, slow the van down as safely as possible. And then, you know, make contact with this moose. Probably, I think they were going around 65 to 70 kilometers an hour. So there's a picture on their Instagram and the moose essentially caved in the entire front of the vehicle. You know, the vehicle is written off completely. And the moose didn't, it didn't kill the moose. It tells you how it broke, I think, two of its legs. But so they were able to call the police um, who came. They had to put the moose down. Um secure the vehicle, and they were towed to Wawa. Um, upon arriving in Wawa, they were kind of told sort of a, well, you guys are kind of out of luck, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Johnny and Renee being Johnny and Renee, and of course, Brendan and their sound guy, Brent, who's another lovely guy who's actually from Ottawa. He mixes a Jessia and a couple other pop artists. He's an awesome guy. Um, They did what great Canadian indie bands and you know up and coming bands do is they didn't waste their time they didn't give up they put their heads together and went all right how do we figure this out and they went across the street to the gas station and just started making inquiries does anything from here which is wawa which is another five hours outside of thunder bay does anything from here go to thunder bay and when does it go and how quickly can we get there and in beautiful rock and roll serendipity, the man at the gas station had told them, well, every once in a while, a coach bus comes through here at about 1.30. And, you know, I can't remember what day of the week it is, but I think he might stop in Thunderway, Thunder Bay on his way to Kenora. You never know. And as luck would have it, you know, Johnny looks down at his watch and it's 1.25. You know, Renee looks over her shoulders and out of the darkness pulls this highway coach bus with like next to nobody on it, which is important. So they befriend the driver and say, Hey man, like we really need to get to Thunder Bay. We've been in this horrible accident. Can you help us out? And like any great Canadian, he says, How much stuff do you got? <laughs> and they said, Well, we've got all of our equipment. He's like, No problem. Just throw it under the bus. And uh they ended up showing up early. <laughs> You know, like we loaded in at 10 and at 1030, their gear arrived and they went and they, you know, they, they made the most of the opportunity and you gotta, you gotta root for people like that who just don't just, you know, throw in the towel. I mean, you guys almost died perfectly reasonable to be like, okay, I guess we'll just, you know, collect our thoughts and find our way home. They were like, no, this train doesn't stop. We are going to Thunder Bay no matter what it takes. And, you know, like, more than anything, when they showed up, it was like all of us on the theory crew was just like a sense of pride, you know, that these guys just, they understand they're doing it for the right reasons and they understand what it means and, you know, what it takes, you know, and by any means necessary. And, you know, you just got to cheer for, root for people like that, you know, and the fact that they make great music doesn't help either, but they're great people. Yeah, the the show must go on, which is their their attitude, which is yeah. very, very rock and roll. And I I have a memory just to show how desolate Wawa is. When I was a kid, we went on a road trip with our family, and you know this is what I remember is is there's basically nothing for like an hour on each side of Wawa. So Wawa is known as you have to stop for gas when you go yes. through Wawa because there's nothing for an hour on each side. And I remember they would take advantage of that. So when I was a kid, gas was, I don't know, say 40 cents. And when you get to Wawa, it was 77 cents because they knew like everyone has to fill yeah, up. Here. So I remember stop. getting gouged. You know, now we we wish it was 77. But I remember getting gouged in, in <laughs> Wawa because they knew if you don't fill up here, you you will not make it to wherever you're going. Oh, yeah. I remember uh, the very first cross Canada tour I did uh, in the band that would become Idle Sons. Um, we had uh, one buddy come out to be like our roadie, uh, a lovely guy by the name of Drew, who ended up coming out on several tours with us in the Idle Sons days. And we were driving late at night. Um, I had almost killed us trying to pass the semi into oncoming traffic, which is a rite of passage on that particular highway. And he was the one who was like, I'm pretty sure if we don't get gas here, we won't get gas. There won't be any gas. And we pulled into 
what at the time appeared to me to be like the most desolate looking little Petro Canada station, you know, at the corner of an intersection on the side of the highway. Um, and, you know, there was like one like very old, like 70 something year old man with, you know, suspenders and a pipe working behind the till. And he was literally like, well, it's a good thing you stopped here, boys. You know, like, if you didn't get gas here, you'll never get gas. And yeah, forever. And that was the thing. And then, yeah, the price was astronomical at the time. Yeah. So I, it really I, hasn't changed all that much. No, they're still taking advantage. I, hey, still it's, pretty desolate it's, out it's there. business, I mean, there's baby. There's a big national park on one side of Wawa. Um, in between Sault Ste. Marie and Wawa, I think, I believe, is a national park which is also why you have so much wildlife, you know? And again, the first time driving through there in a van, you know, there's like elk on the side of the road and mook and moose. And it's like, when it gets dark, you just see eyes out in the distance everywhere. And you're just like, you know, clutch the steering wheel and hoping that, you know, they're not coming for you. Hopefully they behave that night. Uh, I have a uh, fan question sent in. So this is from Shane Murray. He asks, has live sound technology been able to keep up with studio recording technology? For example, singers using voice tuning in studio, but not being able to replicate their voice live. So you can take that however you want to take that. Okay. Um, live audio essentially is on pace with what's out there in the studio world. Um, you don't see a lot of in rock and roll you don't see a lot of live auto-tune um obviously there's the huge debate going on right now with backing tracks and you know vocal to track and whether vocal to track is an acceptable thing for a concert goer um the technology itself is definitely out there it's mostly in the hands of the engineers out on the road and the artists themselves as to what gets used and how judiciously it does get used um playback audio or you know what they call tracks in live music has been around since the 70s you know it's ZZ top was using it in the early 80s on eliminator you know all that synth stuff was all done back then with adat machines or reel to reel you know and now it's all digital with computers with either pro tools digital performer ableton all these platforms and it's really up to the artists to decide how judiciously they use that stuff. Um, I'm kind of fortunate that uh, all of the artists I work for, some do use tracks, but everyone is very cognizant and judicious about the idea that, you know, this thing could fail and then the emperor has no clothes. So we need to be smart and not get carried away with how much of this we're going to use. It's a, it's a real Pandora's box. And, as much as the diehards will tell you that, you know, auto-tune killed, you know, the great musical performance in the studio, it's just as at risk in doing the same thing in live. And it's really easy for people to look and see the easy way out and go, well, this is easy. We just, you know, just a little more track here, a little more track there. We're good. So it's it's definitely... It's definitely a hot button issue. It's kind of taken off right now in the U S this war um, with fans and artists about the usage of backing tracks and how much backing tracks are being used and by what artists, you know, on the other side of the coin, I, you know, I'm, I would be remiss to say that no one should be shocked that, you know, Motley Crue are using tracks. Well, you know, like Vince Neil's in his sixties, man, like, and he's not in the greatest of health on a good day. Like, of course they're using tracks. Well, Kiss are using tracks. Well, you know, those guys are in their 70s. Like, you know, and all of your pop stars are using tracks. And, you know, it's tough. It's it's definitely a, a slippery slope, I would say. So you you had a really busy 2022. Uh, some of the artists you worked with, Tim Hicks, Our Lady P, St. Asonia, Sheepdogs, Big Rack. Is there any... is do you have any stories you can share about uh, working with any of those artists? Just, I don't know, anything that just pops up now that is interesting or funny or memorable. Um, uh, with Tim, we did a rodeo um, north of Dawson Creek. Um, 
it was so busy last summer and artists were so desperate to find technicians and crew guys that I ended up going across Canada three times in three days. So we did a show in Grand Forks, BC with Theory of a Dead Man. Um, me and Andy, their front of house engineer and tour manager. And then we basically closed up the truck, drove for four hours to the closest airport, got on a plane and flew to Sydney, Nova Scotia to do a Hunter Brothers show. Um, basically landed at the airport, drove out to Sydney, you know, said hi to the guys as quickly as I can, organized the gear that was there. Um, luckily, they have a few other guys on their crew that were already on site that did most of the heavy lifting. So I just got to look cool. Um, came in, knocked that show out, out, you know, went to a hotel, slept for four hours, drove to the airport, and then got on a plane and flew to Grand Prairie, Alberta, and then drove up to, uh, I think it was Dawson, which is only a couple hours from Grand Prairie on a 43, and then did a rodeo with Tim. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I was really tired. Um, Tim is such a pro. He's such a good dude. You know, him and his band, all the guys are really great. Um, country is really cool like that where, you know, even with the musicians, they'll, sometimes there's a bit of a rotating cast because, you know, there's only like 10 or 15 real gunslinger guitar players in Canada that will do Canadian country. So uh, Andrew McTaggart, who's one of Tim's regular league guitar players, couldn't make it. He's married to Susie McNeil. So they were uh, down in Vegas working with, um, Steven Tyler. So uh, Jeff Torn, who is another guy, who's another real gunslinger, um, who actually I think lives in like Scotland now or something, came in and subbed in. So there was a little, little of juggling going on, but we, we made it all happen. And then uh, got in the car with the, I got in the cube truck with Adrian, the modern engineer, and drove after the show back to Grand Prairie got on a plane and flew to another gig. And that was the whole summer. Um, another great one was uh, the Air Lady Peace guys. Um, Smashing Pumpkins were out on tour with um, Jane's Addiction. And Jane's Addiction had a COVID emergency crisis where a bunch of guys in the camp got COVID and they had to cancel. So Our Lady Peace got a phone call on Thursday you know, before a show that was on like Monday saying, Hey, can you guys hop on this tour and support Smashing Pumpkins for the next five days? You know, while the Jane's Addiction camp, you know, recuperates and gets themselves back together. Um, which led to me getting a phone call Thursday night from John Morley, who was their tour manager, saying, Hey, can you come do this gig? And unfortunately, I wasn't actually able to. So I had said, said, no, but, you know, here's a list of guys that I think could do it, you know, and then I kind of put it out of my head. But then Sunday night, the phone rings again, probably about like six at night. And it's John. He's like, hey, the guy that we had that was going to come in, he bailed too. what can I do to convince you to come out and do this gig? I was like, OK, well, look, let me make a few phone calls and see if I can push a few things around it was more of a personal um commitment that i had than a professional one that it prevented me so i went to my wife kind of with my hat in my hand and went like Geez, you know like these guys are really stuck and luckily she's pretty understanding most of the time except when i kind of put her behind the eight ball like this and she said yeah sure man like yeah we we don't want our friends to have any problems and uh so uh james forsyth who has you know been with the band as uh, Steve Mazur and before him, like Turner's guitar tech for, you know, like 25 years who had fallen ill. Um, hopefully at the airing of this, he's, he's doing better. Um, he called me and was like, all right, you know, like I'll meet you at the band's lockup and we'll go through everything. And, and it was basically like their entire regular touring crew was unavailable. And, uh, John, who was their tour manager, had kind of pulled as many favors as he could to get people from here and there. So, you know, he was able to convince Andy DeVoe to come in and do it. And um, a, a different monitor engineer and all these different people. And luckily, you know, like Canada, there's an environment amongst professionals that work in the other side of the curtain 
where you know like i'm not your enemy you know like sometimes guys can be i find it's a little more in the u.s but it's kind of changing as the generations change you know like oh this is my this is my gig and I do it my way and I'm not going to show you what I do because you're going to take it from me. Uh, you know, that it's it, that attitude is going away and the attitude of more like, okay, what can we do collectively to make this as good as it can be? So James was kind enough to, you know, get out of his sick bed and drive down to the band's lockup and walk me through all this gear, you know, and it's like 10 in the morning and I have to be at the Scotiabank arena at 1130 and, you know, we're kind of loading gear and he's explaining how things work in this ear, you know, and I'm on the phone with John and the other ear going like, okay, what do we need? And, and we went down and uh, the band did what real professional bands always do, which is just knock it right out of the park. And it was probably a really interesting and pleasant surprise for an audience that had no idea that Jay's Addiction wasn't showing up until about noon the day of the show. And it was like, by the way, James Edition isn't going to be here, but here's Our Lady Peace, who came out and then played, you know, like 15 number one hit songs from a 20 plus year career, you know, that people are essentially singing the whole time. It was a really great moment. And uh, Jason and Duncan Rain, and specifically because I deal with them the most, Steve Mazer are just really great guys and true professionals. And uh, Steve's one of those guys where, you know, like, we don't talk often, but when we do, it's like, oh, hey, buddy. Like, you know, there's no pretense, which is fantastic. And yeah. uh, the rest of the summer was uh, firmly entrenched doing some uh, country stuff with the Hunter Brothers, who are these five very delightful young men from Shonovan, Saskatchewan. They're all, all brothers. They're all ex-professional hockey players. And they're farmers. And you will never find five more genuinely nice, friendly, honest people in your life. And uh, I kind of topped that off by going down to the U.S. and doing all, a bunch of the big rock and roll festivals with the Theory guys. So we were out at Blue Ridge and Louder Than Life and Aftershock. And those days are awesome because they're like big Brody reunions. And, you know, the spectacle is like, you know. One of those festivals is bigger than every festival in Canada <laughs> combined. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned that, you know, professional audio professionals in Canada or, or you know, live event professionals in Canada kind of have this brotherly love and, and everyone's helping each other and it's doing what's best for the show and, and yeah. with the bands you're working with. And that in the U.S., it seems like it's going more and more in that direction. And I remember you posting about the Disturbed tour, the Disturbed shows, how nice the the professionals with Disturbed are as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're very fortunate just, you know, by way of being at it for so long. And I was exposed to the American market First, when I start went to work for Finger Eleven, and prior to that, um, Idle Sons actually toured the United States quite extensively. When we were on Atlantic, um, you get to meet, you know, people on different crews, and it's the same thing. It's like this little pool. There's only the pool is only so big, so you eventually end up running into the same people. And so I had met a gentleman by the name of Nick Engel, who's disturbed stage manager um 10 years ago he worked for motley crew he was tommy lee's drum tech so you definitely get yourself in these positions where you know you walk onto a stage and you're like i know that guy hey buddy you know how's it going and you know the thing to do also especially when you're a support act is the idea is to be kind of like the the red-headed stepchild you know like seen and not heard you know you go in you do the very best job you can do, but you don't ruffle feathers. You don't push someone else's stuff around. You, you, you try your utmost not to complain, which can be, you know, a very difficult practice uh, at the best of times. And, you know, you want the headliner to feel like having this other band isn't a burden, you know, that, that, you know, this opening band is going to enhance the show. And, uh, yeah, the crew, Nick, their stage manager, and uh, Barrett and J Jamie and Jeremy, all their crew guys are, like, super duper nice. And the same thing, when you start working with bands at that level, guys that have been around for a while, um, 
for me, I always find it's like one of two ways. It's either like everyone is so friendly because they've seen it all and nothing's really a big deal anymore. Or everyone is so angry because they've seen it all and now they're super jaded. So, you know, it always kind of, and I've been on this where it's been the opposite where we don't get treated great. And, you know, it seems people are out to get almost, which in reality, it's not that. It's just that you just don't matter is what it's really about. So it's always nice to hop on a tour when it's that big. Like, I'm sure there are tickets, but I think Disturbed needs help selling tickets. So it's nice to be treated well. So I, I have one final question. We'll dive into your five favorite albums. And sure. this, this question requires that I share my screen. So I have a picture here. Let me know if you can see this. Can you see this picture? Yes. So <laughs> you, you're always posting pictures on the road and you have this little piglet in the, in the pictures. What is the backstory with this piglet? <laughs> so that is from lovely wife. It actually springs back even further. Uh, in 2009, I was working for an artist named Justin Nozuka, and we went out and did a co-headlining tour with uh, an Australian artist named Missy Higgins. And there was a third on that tour um, who was a songwriter named Lenka, who was actually a very popular television personality in Australia who also had a musical career. And her tour manager was a gentleman by the name of Mayer, who now tore my hand down, but back then he tore managed uh, Matchbox 20 and a bunch of those really big bands. And we met on the first day and we got along really well. And, you know, we did everything we could to help them because they had kind of a smaller group of people working uh, in, on their crew. And obviously Ed and his guys, they all pitched in and tried to help us. And at the end of the tour, he gave me a, like a little token. And he was like, yeah, you know, like this is like a good luck charm. Take it with you. And hopefully it'll bring you good luck. On um, the next year, we were doing a festival in France and somebody stole it right off my work box. And I was kind of crestfallen. And my wife, Jennifer, was like, well, you know, I've got this little stuffed animal and I think he's really cute. And, you know, he could bring you good luck. And then maybe you could take some pictures of him and send them to me. And, you know, and maybe he'll remind you of me when you're out there working and so that's sort of how it was born. So we named him Giptel because you don't want to get sued. And I started a little Instagram account for him. And uh, yeah, he goes out and he sits in my work box. And I usually take a picture and post it on Instagram so my wife can see it. And it kind of started off as being just her. That was she was the only person that was uh, following that particular Instagram account. And then, you know, some of my buddies were like, oh, that's pretty funny. You know, like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that, too. Like, yeah, I want to follow your Insta your little stuffed animals Instagram account. And then now I think we're up to like 600 followers of people, uh, you know, kind of from around the world and around the entertainment industry and random fans of bands that have seen them. Um, when I was working with Mary and his trench, the, his little account got a shout out on one of their live streams. And like the next day he had like 40 friend following requests. What's, what's the account so people can find the it? account is a uh, totally not Giptel, which is just the word piglet spelled backwards. Um, yeah, and it's just something that I, I've done, you know, kind of like now it's more superstition than anything. I, I feel like if I don't get a shot of him doing something every day when I'm away, that something bad might happen to me. The, uh, the rock and roll gods will punish you if you don't continue. Yeah, man. With... Well, there's one thing about rock and roll. There's always a healthy dose of superstition. That's very true. So let's dive into the uh, the five favorite albums. Yeah. Do you, let's start by naming all five so people know what we're going to dive into, and then we'll go through them one at a time. Do all you right. want to name the five, or do you want me yeah, to Yeah, I'll them? see if I remember the five that I told you. <laughs> Something I tried to do was kind of pick different records from different eras and different genres to an extent. So we would have different music to talk about. So it's not just like, oh, I love heavy metal, 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 you know? So um. 
not necessarily in chronological order. Um, I picked um, 1970s What's Going On, which is Marvin Gaye's basically Motown masterpiece. Um, also one of the great concept records, which is about the Vietnam War and post-traumatic stress and what it's like coming home from war. That was, uh, I felt a must, a must. Um, the second album I picked, which is probably definitely in my top five for real, for real, for real top five, is a 1992 Slip by Quicksand. Um, this is the greatest record never heard for anyone that's a fan of modern rock, post-hardcore, emo. Um, this is sort of the granddaddy of them all. This was one of the records that, for me, I'm sure people will look a little further back, defined so much of you know, modern hard rock and alternative rock in the 90s. Um, I cannot think of many bands that I know that don't love that record. Um, the next one, kind of switching genres, was uh, 1989's Public Enemy, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, which is, you know, I think Public Enemy is the greatest hip-hop group of all time. Um, people like to point to lots of artists from the 90s or the 2000s. Um, it Takes a Nation of Millions is, you know, it's such a statement record. To me, it's the hip hop equivalent of, you know, the first Rage Against the Machine album. You know, like it's socially conscious and political. And, you know, Chuck D is the great, I think, one of the greatest MCs of all time. But it's not without its humor, thanks to Flavor Flav. Number three, I picked uh, Failure's Fantastic Planet. Um, another one of those records that, like, you've probably been influenced by and you just don't know it uh number four we're on number four right number five so we're on the number last five, one is so the, the last super one group. is a real personal one for me because this record came out around the same time as the idol sons record um it's the band is called army of anyone and i believe the record is self-titled yeah you just mentioned it's a super group so it's the DeLeo brothers from stone temple pilots ray loser who would become the drummer of Corn, and Robert Patrick of Filter, who, you know, when we were in Idle Sons, uh, Filter, Stone Temple Pilots were two bands that we really looked up to. And uh, fast forward like 20 years later, I got a chance to meet the brothers. Um, Theory did a, a series of dates with them in the United States and in Japan. And I think I could not muster the courage to fanboy out um, both Robert and Dean were very gracious. Um, Dean's bass tech was a super nice guy. Um, but that record is another one where it's like, this is such a good record that nobody has heard. Or maybe not nobody, but not enough people have heard. When when I interviewed Bill Priddle of Trouble Charger, he mentioned that he did some shows with the DeLeo brothers and he yeah. said how nice they were, that they actually like bought him something it's something like I, i'm probably butchering the story but i think yeah. bill mentioned he loved the sound of one of their pedals and they just like bought him the pedal or it was something where they were just so <laughs> nice and so gracious so yeah they're just you know i had i had the the opportunity to meet them you know only about four or five years ago now and yeah they were just genuine down to earth good people and it's always good to see because i mean that was my problem was like, I, I couldn't muster the words to talk to, to Robert, especially without saying like, you were my idol. You were my hero. Like you were so awesome at what you do and you look so cool. And without just kind of gushing all over myself, I learned that the hard way when I met um, Brett from Macedon, I totally freaked him out because I just gushed all over him with, you know, compliments and all this stuff. And I, I think I scared them off a bit. So I wanted to maybe try and keep that to a minimum this time. So before we dive into each of those albums specifically, how much yeah. do you think those five albums together influenced you as a bass player and then eventually uh, your band Idol Sons? Because when I, you know, I have the, the, uh, good fortune of listening to all five of those albums in a row. So I went through them all okay. multiple times. That must but have it's been like, an interesting ride. Yeah. And one thing is, all five of those albums 
have incredible bass and and you might think it's different genres and hip hop and rock and whatever uh, all of them have sneaky good bass through through them so i'm thinking you as a bass player maybe that's something if you weren't aware that at least subconsciously <laughs> they all have really incredible bass which is your instrument of choice um no i'd say that that was probably one of the main reasons why i liked all of those records um if we look at what's going on um obviously the majority of that record was recorded by what is probably regarded as the greatest modern bass player of all time which is james jamerson um he influenced everybody. If you go to any sort of like Wikipedia page on Jamerson, he's literally the most influential pop rock soul bass player of all time. Um, his feel is just unbelievable, you know, and his use of like, you know, the three, the five, the seven, as far as playing fills and how tasty of a player he is, you know, he, he really cannot be beat. Um, Robert, DeLeo from Army of Anyone and Some Total Pilots has actually stated many times in interviews that Jamerson was his biggest influence. And it shows because he approaches the instrument similarly at times. Um, we go to the other side of the coin, um, Greg Edwards and Sergio Vega from Failure and Quicksand, respectively, um, were both uh, pick style players who use more chordal modes. I mean, you know, which I went through a phase where I wanted to play chords and and that was inspired by those two records. And then um, Public Enemy, Public Enemy, you know, a lot of the samples that Terminator X is using is Motown or, you know, uh, Muscle Shoals or, you know, the bomb, the bomb squad, who was the production group that put those that record together. Like there's just a lot of iconic samples that are buried you know it's hard to tell you know and like i looked up night of the living bass heads the other day just to see what was going on and you know there's like a hundred samples in that song and i would be damned if i could pick out any of them it just turns into this kind of melange of chaos and you know i'd love i love that record so much so let's Let's dive into the five albums. Let's go in the order in which you gave them to me. So the first okay. one would be Failures, Fantastic Planet. This comes out in 1996. So there's three singles, Stuck on You, Pitiful, and Saturday Savior. There's 17 songs and the clock's yeah. in at 68 minutes long. So this is like a full journey that you go through. Uh, yeah. for, for our listeners that haven't heard this album, how would you describe the sound? Um, failure is a band and I'm stealing this quote and I think I'm stealing it from James Black of Finger Eleven. Failure is a band where every chord is lower than you think it's going to be in pitch. Um, it's funny when you say that the signal singles were stuck on you, Saturday Savior and Pitiful. Um, obviously stuck on you is a fantastic song. And one of my favorites, um, the nurse who loved me is probably the best song on the record in my mind. I think it's one of the greatest rock songs ever written. Um, it gained more notoriety when someone else played it than when they played it. Um, people who kind of go in those circles in the you know hard rock, alt rock circles will know it as a perfect circle. So that's version of it. So when I'm listening to the album, yeah, I didn't even get to that song yet to listen to it. I'm just looking at the track list, and that's such a unique. You know, the nurse yeah, who loved exactly. me is so unique that I go wait, that's in a perfect circle song. And then obviously I know that this album's 96 and a perfect circle is the two thousands. Yeah. So I always thought that that was in a perfect circle song until listening to this. Yeah. And it's great because perfect circles interpretation of it is so different than the song that's on the record. And uh, I recently kind of did like a deep dive kind of rediscovering failure. Cause I was a big fan when it came out and I was a fan of the record before that, which is called magnified which is more of like a, a hard rock record where fantastic planet is more of like a, a space rock odyssey, but uh, discovering how they made that album basically on their own. Um, they were signed to a record label called metal blade, which is, you know, also signed like bands like cannibal corpse. And didn't they have and, like the original metallic album or something like, way, uh, it way could be yeah. The before day. they signed to air the Electra, they might've had, they may have had the first Metallica record, but you know, that album was just this record that just sounded 
different. And yeah, you know, when you listen to Saturday Savior, it's the same way. Like everything is just so low, like not like just bassy, but like rich and it's like all kind of baritone and it's just such an incredible sounding record too. And to find out all these years later that they had essentially done it by themselves in a house they rented with like some like kind of like mid-level Mackie console that you could get at like Guitar Center. And they came out with this record that sounds so awesome. And uh, I remember driving in my, uh, I had a K car when I was in high school and hearing Stuck on You on the radio, which had a very brief stint on rock radio in Canada. Um, I was actually on CFNY at least once and being like, what the hell is this? Like, where do I find this? Like, and then, you know, going home and like turning on the wedge on much music and like, you know, just recording VCR tapes worth of videos, hoping to catch a video, which I finally did after like, you know, like two months of trying. And the video for stuck on you is filmed entirely in silhouette. And it's basically, I don't know, sure if you were ever, ever tracked it down. It's basically an homage to all of the openings of uh, the James Bond movies in the seventies where they did the thing with the, uh, you know, the silhouettes would turn into morph into other silhouettes. And it's, it's such a cool, cool, cool video. It's one of the coolest videos I've seen by a rock band. And I'm proud and I'm happy to say that failure actually got back together about five or six years ago and they're making records again and they're making really great albums. And one of the things they did was they went back and did a redux of that video and he did like a 4k ai upscaling and you can watch a high def version of that video and he also has a really great ken andrews has a really great sort of tutorial series on youtube because since failure he's become like a world famous record producer working with bands like tenacious d and mixing records and uh he there's a great like 20 minute video on how they were able to make that failure music video and everything it took to do it and it's awesome it's really great um yeah um there's another song at the end of the album which is the album starts and ends with sort of the same kind of interlude the chime and, yeah the chimes and the clock being wound um the last i think it's the last song on the record is a song called daylight which is kind of it's in the same vein as the nurse who loved me where there's just a moment in the song where everything is so loud and so chaotic. You're not sure if it's possible that it can get any louder or any wilder. And, you know, like I always find myself, you know, listening to that record. If you listen to it with your eyes closed and you get to, you know, the climax of the nurse who loved me, you know, and it's just, everything's on 10 and it's so loud, but it's also so deliberate you know you know the drums are just doing this quarter note figure you know that's deadly in time and kelly scott the drummer from failure probably doesn't get enough credit because i'm sure it's probably way harder to play that slow than it is to play fast and it's so powerful and you know if you listen to it with your eyes closed you find yourself sort of like clenching your fists waiting for this moment for this apex and every time you think it's there it just kind of goes one little step higher and higher and higher and higher and then you know you get to this swirling chaos and then everything stops and it goes all the way back down to just ken andrew's voice and acoustic guitar and then the song ends and it's like wow what what a, what, a, what a release man i think that's all i have to say you could do a two-hour deep dive with me just on that one album man well let's keep going with this album what <laughs> what uh what really impressed me was the amount of ideas that they had on this yeah. album and somehow they pulled everything off as one cohesive project. So there's the yeah. whole like space um, theme to it be, be between the, the cover of the album. There's like really spacey production sounds, the oh, lyrics. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's wild how there's so many just I, I, ideas floating around and, and, different sounds and it all works they they land they stick the landing yeah. which is hard to believe well it's it's amazing to think that you know like 
the song Smoking Umbrellas, which is kind of in the middle of the record, which is kind of mid tempo y and got this cool drum thing going on, is on the same record as Saturday Savior and Stuck on You. And, you know, all, all these songs are really great and they all have a thread that keeps them cohesive as an entire vision, but they're all different. And man, I find the bass playing is is very unique on some of the songs like Smoking oh, dude, Umbrella. Like, and and yeah. I love the sound of the bass. So uh, some of the songs like Saturday Savior, Sergeant Politeness, they have really crisp, clean bass yeah. that I love. And then some of the later songs have like really distorted. There's an effect on it. And yeah, I just love very everything the bass fuzzy. player is doing here. Yeah. Uh, Greg, I, at least it was Greg Edwards and Ken Andrews are sort of the creative force behind the band at the time. And they traded off, you know, who played what when they were recording the record. But yeah, he does a lot of really cool chord based stuff. I think he's playing an Ibanez um, with a humbucker in it, but it's just such a cool sound. Like they're just a cool sounding band and unique. You know, nobody really sounds like them. There's, there's three different segues. So it's, (laughs) it's, actual like songs there's three different segues on the album yes what what do you think the the purpose is of these segues uh, you know i don't really know i mean for me it's when I, when I listen to that record front to back it's a good chance to kind of catch your breath and sort of like cleanse your palate it's really neat because on their latest record which they just put out last year uh the, this first one i think has segue segue one two and three or something like that the latest record has like Segway 7, 8, and 9 or something. So they kind of went back to that idea on their latest record. But yeah, I definitely, for me, gives me a chance to sort of like collect your thoughts and go like, okay, okay, what's what are they going to do next? Which I think is genius. Yeah, my understanding for bands that do that so someone like tool that has a lot of like interludes and instrumentals and segues and all that bands like tool they use it for a few reasons so one you already mentioned is like to cleanse your palate in between say something like really heavy and it's like oh where do we go from here and it's like a palate cleanser Uh, the other two reasons are sometimes two songs don't really flow one into the next very well so the the this instrumental in between is like a good flow sonically between the two songs that should be backed up sequencing and um the the other one is also for a certain feeling or a certain mood so just adding like one minute of i don't know uh creepy sounds just adds to the overall painting that they're trying to paint so that's my understanding of 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 the segues sounds Uh, good (laughs) <laughs> so there's a song called Pillowhead, and what's cool is there's actually a New York band called Pillowhead that got their name from that song. Oh, awesome! So that uh, what else? I got uh, just a couple more things. Um, so yeah, the the album was actually produced by the band itself, which you don't yes. you don't always see. And um, y- you mentioned that maybe that that added to maybe that that gave them confidence in being able to be so creative with this album is that it's just them doing what they want and they don't necessarily have like a label guy that's telling them. Yeah. It has to be more I think commercial. so. You know, I'm um, coming from personal experience when, you know, we got to make two records as idle sons, one that never came out on Atlantic and one that did come out on EMI. And yeah, there's definitely uh the role of a producer can definitely vary, you know, um, on the first record, our producer had a very, very strong kind of sway over us as far as, you know, do this, do that. I think, you you know, you should do this, you should do that. And on the second record, which we made with Garth, um, he was sort of more like, well, I could make my own record whenever I want. Let's make your record. I'm just going to rein you in and make sure that you're not getting too far out into the weeds here. And you can definitely tell on the Failure album that, you know, the uh, the kids were given the keys to the candy store and just you know told uh, you know they were just allowed to go out and make their record which i think is awesome so as as we wrap up with this album and we dive into the next one uh, i have 
some positive reviews that came out around the time of the album that I thought you would enjoy. So um, the Daily Utah Chronicle said, failure separates themselves from the guitar buzzed masses by balancing thick riffs with intricate arrangements and intelligent lyrics. They highlight the album's final two tracks, Heliotropic and Daylight, that you talked about, as its crowning achievement writing that the songs are two manipulated masterpieces with tribal drums, treated guitars, spacey synthesizers, and dubbed vocals. It sounds like a mess when broken down, but flows weightlessly and gracefully in and out of the listener's mind. Uh, and then uh, a couple other things. Uh, Sound Lab said the album was an impressively focused affair with each track fitting perfectly into an over- uh, overarching story of addiction fueled disassociation and the last thing is uh just press play named fantastic planet the third best album of the 90s and decibel magazine included fantastic planet in their hall of fame naming it a cult classic and an album that paints its heaviness in a gorgeous way so i thought you would enjoy uh all of those as a fan of that album yeah i do i really do so let's dive into the next album. So Quicksand, uh, the album is Slip from 1993. How how does this album come into your life? Do you remember the first time? Yeah, I do this? remember the first time I heard it because I heard it from a friend. Um, in high school, I had a buddy. We had a buddy, a guy named Jason Buzza, who just knew like all, he was like, like that guy that knew like the coolest stuff. Like, you know, when all your friends were into Poison, he was into Fugazi. You know, like he was just sort of on, you know, looking into more of the uncharted territories of what was out there. And yeah, he showed up. I showed up at his, uh, his buddy's at a buddy's place to jam. And he was like, oh, you got to hear this record. You got to hear this record. And he played me uh, the lead track phaser. And I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. I was like 15, maybe when that record came out in 1993, I think. I think it came out in 93 maybe it was 92 um i think i was around 15 when i heard it and the first thing i did was i went out and tried to find it which was difficult because it was not everywhere <laughs> um when i got it i think i bought two copies and i gave it one to uh brian barkwell who would become the drummer of vital sons for his birthday and that album at that time um circulated around our circle circle of friends and fellow musicians in the area and like everybody thought that was the greatest album and man much music started playing the second single off the record freezing process on the power hour <laughs> which is hilarious because if you listen to this it's not a metal album it's just you know i don't know what to call it and like i remember someone making fun of me and calling me a sellout because i liked freezing process you know, and this is like an obscure record that, you know, nobody really knows about. Um, but there's a song on that album called Dine Alone, which people do understand what that means now, because Dine Alone Records got their name, I believe, from that song. And Walter was involved with those guys for a while. But man, that's another record that I can listen to front to back over and over again, man. like every song. So this album is is like a landmark album for the genre of post hardcore. And when I think of yeah. post hardcore, I think of Alex on Fire. And yeah. when I look at this album and I see the song Dine Alone, I'm thinking, okay, Dine Alone Records. So when I go and check, uh, it, it it says on the on the website. Uh, the name is drawn from the song Dine Alone by the post hardcore band Quicksand. So Dine Alone Records is named after the song from quicksand and again groundbreaking post hardcore album that inspires the name of the label which goes on yeah. to have alexis on fire which helps popularize the post hardcore genre so it's, yeah. it's kind and of all one thing one lineage going through there yeah and if i'm not mistaken walter from quicksand is actually in a city in color video no way i think he's in the video for save your scissors at least i want him to be <laughs> but i think the reach of this album is much further than post hardcore you know i think it cast a huge net across modern rock because this was the album that all the alt rock and modern rock guys that wanted to be like heavy every once in a while would you know spin this one up and be like oh dude like you know check this out you know this song's called head to wall like listen to it it's so you know and, and those songs are like they're so aggressive but elegant 
and focused like they're so focused you know there's like not a wasted note not a wasted drum beat nothing you know and of course sergio vega the bass player of quicksand went on to become the bass player of deftones after chi chang passed and was played bass on you know eight or nine deftones records before he ended up leaving the band but um their second they only put out like three records there's only before they broke up the first time this is another band that has since reformed and released three more really awesome records but the first three quicksand albums the first one being an ep the, this one slip and the record after this manic compression are all fantastic records and you know like they're just so focused you know like they're not a note out of place it's not it's angry without being mad but ag- aggressive without being overbearing you know it's there's an elegance to the whole thing it's it's like surgical at least in my mind uh, one one thing that brings the Dine Alone Records thing full circle is uh, Quicksand puts out this album. The They inspire Joel Carrier that goes on to start Dine Alone Records. Dine Alone names their label after the song from this album. And then in 2012, Dine Alone Records released the reissue of this album on vinyl. Really? Oh my which God. ties like everything yeah. together, you know, I mean, Dine Alone goes on to be so successful as a label and then they get to reissue the album that inspired the name of the yeah. uh, label. So that was well, that's fantastic. Sweet. Yeah. And uh, I, again, to me, the bass stands out on this album. Uh, so yeah. you have, so there's the four singles, Dine Alone, Phaser, Omission, Freezing Process on two of the singles, the bass starts the song. Like it's this the very start of the song is cool bass riffs. And then in two of the other singles after the choruses, there's breakdowns where it's essentially just bass. So it's like bass is like a lead instrument in, in a lot of these songs. Yeah. Well, I mean, and again, if, if we can get into like technique and nonce, that kind of stuff, you know, Sergio Vega plays bass like it's a lead instrument, you know, like, again, there's a lot of chording being done. There's a lot of, small pocket riffs and you know he, he's throwing he's writing new riffs that aren't anywhere else in the song you know sometimes especially with guitar driven rock you know there's a riff that everybody plays right like the bass plays it and the guitar plays it and you know mm-hmm. the drums are syncing up or syncing to it you know with with the quicksand record with what sergio was doing back then is you know like throwing things in that no one else in the ensemble is doing at the time which I always thought was really cool. And he had such a cool, interesting, distinct tone. Yeah, I, I probably, again, there's n- there's not much I could say about this record that isn't just like effusive enthusiasm because it, it, and it means so much to me. It's a record that means so much to me. Like, I think, you know, when I first started dating the woman that would become my wife, it was like the first record I played for it. Like, oh, you gotta listen to this. You gotta listen to this. It's just like, what the hell is this you know she ended up being just as big of a fan as i was in the end but that's how you knew she was the one if she yeah pretty much she likes cool music and she could tolerate me yeah another way that this was uh groundbreaking is when when quicksand signed to polydor uh polydor in 1992 it was the first post-hardcore band to sign to a major label so it kind of opened the door to what was possible as a band that had a, a harder sound yeah, well, I think if if you like any kind of hard music from, you know, metal to post-hardcore, you know, screamo, prog rock, prog metal, this album, you can sit with this record and listen to it and find something about it that you like. So as we wrap up on this album and, and then we move into your third favorite album here, uh, I have two quick reviews and then some top 10 lists that it's on. So all music says quicksand music is about powerful anger and the persistent bludgeoning of slip delivers the goods. BBC described the record as a 40 minute masterclass in post hardcore perfection. And then it was on three different top 10 lists. So metal hammer has it in the top 10 essential post hardcore albums. Treble uh, has it in the 10 essential nineties post hardcore albums. And the album is included in decibel magazines hall of fame. So that's, that's everything I have for, uh, for that album. (laughs) The important thing to note is they have since reformed and put out three amazing albums, starting with one called interiors. And it's, Almost like they picked up where they left off. Unfortunately, Tom Capone, the lead guitarist who played on the first two records, is no longer in the band. 
but everybody else is. And, uh, you know, Walter sounds as disappointed in society and angry as he ever did without being overbearing. And, like, they're just so awesome, man. Like, yeah, go listen to the record, Internet. <laughs> Internet. So the, uh, the, the third album on your list, Public Enemies, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. This comes out in 19, uh, 19, I have 1998. That's 1988, I believe, right? Yeah, 88, 89. Nine, nine, okay, 1988. So, um, why does this album mean so much to you? This is kind of the, uh, you know, the outlier in, in, yeah, your, in well, your five. I went like, like everybody as, as a kid, you go through phases, you know, if as a lover of music where, you know, you were just deeply into a genre or a style. And I went through like a pretty strong hip hop phase, like grade seven, grade eight. And this, I think might've been one of the first cassettes I ever bought. And it was mostly because I had heard Black Steel in the Hour of Chaos and been like, wow, man, this is this is hip hop. This is what hip hop's supposed to be. And, you know, like I was popping and locking with like my hat on sideways and my overalls. Like I was full on like mid to late 80s, like rapper wannabe. And this was the first like, well, cassette I had bought that like felt like it was more than just you know, young MC or Rob Bass and DJ Easy, DJ Easy Rock. Like this was like real deal, real hip hop. And uh, I played that tape on my little boom box in my bedroom nonstop front to back. And it was one of the only cassettes I had that my mom really liked. Your and, mom uh, liked this album? Yeah, she thought it was I'm great. Impressed. Yeah. I mean, my mo- my mother's from Trinidad and Tobago, and she's you know she likes ska and calypso and you know reggae and all that stuff. And I would you know there's interludes in this record that are like snippets from live performances, and she was just like, oh man, like they're very angry, but I, I really want to hear what they have to say. And it's another one like for me, the production on the album is just like. There's, as I said earlier, like there's so many samples, but you can't really tell what any of it is. And, you know, the Bomb Squad and Hank Shockley and uh, Terminator X, like they really went above and beyond. And again, you know, Chuck D had something to say that was like really, you know, especially in in New York in the 80s. You know, it's not like New York is now, like New York in the 80s was a dangerous place. And, you know he had things to say about, you know, racism and drug abuse and social consciousness. But on the other hand of the side, you had side of the coin, you had Flavor Flav, you know, being Flavor Flav, especially the ultimate hype Flavor man, Flav, the ultimate hype man who was funny. But, you know, if you listen to like, you know, I can't do nothing for you, man. Like it's about dealing with the homeless population and, and, you know, having standoffs with people you don't know and strangers and, you know, there's actually more to it than just being pretty hilarious. I mean, you know, and then you tie in like, you know, Professor Griff and the S1Ws and the, you know, this like ultra militant sort of Black Pantherish sort of thing. And I mean, this is also an opinion of a guy who grew up in the suburbs, you know, who comes from an ethnic, ethnically diverse, culturally diverse family who grew up in an ethnically diverse and culturally diverse neighborhood. So, you know, there are parts of it you pick up and parts of it you don't, just based on where you grew up. But yeah, I can't, it's, that's another record when I hear a song of it, I don't, I don't turn it off. Recently in an interview I did with uh, Maya Wynn, the singer for the supergroup Envy of None, uh, yeah. she mentioned that she ran into Flava Flav in an airport. And <laughs> my first question was, was he wearing the, the clock around his neck? And she said, yes. And we're like, wow, he must oh, yeah. like, he must like sleep in it, bathe in it. If he was wearing I, it in the uh, airport. I ran into him once. I think it was in Vegas and he was definitely wearing the clock. And uh, I got to meet some of the guys in japan in 2009 they played at fuji rock and i was working for an artist that also played at fuji rock and i you know it's public enemy so you don't you don't stop and say hi or like effusively spill your guts about how much their work means to you you know like you just give them you know a strong nod and you know one of those and you know you go about your day but uh yeah i it's it's such a cool it's such a cool you know important 
record, especially in the hip hop community. And I feel like nowadays in modern hip hop, they don't get talked about enough. You know, like I feel like Public Enemy is, you know, like musically, you know, they should be like what Led Zeppelin is to rock and roll bands. Like everybody, everybody who's in hip hop should love Public Enemy and say it over and over again. But again, maybe I'm just being a little bit of a homer. Yeah, this this album is widely regarded as one of the greatest and most influential hip hop albums yeah. of all time. And what, what's cool that ties all your albums together is uh, they actually set out to create the hip hop equivalent of Marvin Gaye's album, What's Going On, which is one of your top five, yeah. uh, which, which kind of ties it all together. And I, I, you know, I listened to the album a few times and I already knew Bring the Noise and I know it from uh, Tony Hawk too. Oh, okay. I was so it, 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 it was... Well, that's it's the Anthrax version uh, featuring um, Public Enemy. That version is in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 <laughs> that, you know, every kid was obsessed with that game growing yeah. up. Oh, yeah. I, I played and, that game forever. And and that was one of the first songs that kick in. So that's that's how I, I was first introduced to that uh, way back in the day. Well, I remember, I think it was the summer of like 1991 or 1990 when the crossover version with Anthrax came out. And I just remember, like, all my friends that were into metal loved that rec- that song. And all my friends that were into hip-hop loved that song. And it was one of the first ones, you know. Obviously, the uh, Run DMC, Aerosmith, Walk This Way probably predates it by a couple of years. But it was definitely in the first, you know, kind of sampling of hip-hop artists looking at hard rock songs and rock songs and going like oh we we can do something with this and same thing with a metal band going like hey we could we should we should try something so the album when they were recording it uh the album was was at the time of recording called countdown armageddon which i believe is the first song on the album yes and then eventually they changed the name to it takes a, a nation of millions to hold us back and and that is a line from their a song on their first album called raise the roof so i didn't know that that's actually where the the title comes from is from their lyrics well that's the thing like chuck d has so many great i guess i guess in hip-hop you know like one-liners or zingers or you know these phrases that just like stick in your you know like just stay with you like you know even like fight the power or welcome to the terror dome you know base for your face (laughs) Like all of it, like the is the ability of not just being like an incredibly socially conscious MC, but he's got all these like incredibly memorable taglines that go in these songs. And you know, like get the green, black, and red in, you know, one, two, count down to Armageddon. You're just like, you know, I remember that from when I was like 12. And I'll never forget it. So Rolling Stone has a list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. And people, people um reference this list all the time so it's it's like if if an album made that list it is officially one of the greatest albums of all time and this shows up at number 15 on the 500 greatest albums of all time number 15 which is i mean that's that's as high as you can go right top 15 and it's the highest hip-hop album on the list period so i believe if i remember correctly kanye west my dark beautiful twisted fantasy is like number 22 that's those are the top two hip-hop albums really which is weird because that's like probably not the kanye album if i had to pick one i would pick from the first three you would choose probably yeah absolutely like late registration or the college dropout like those are iconic as far you know as far as what i consider hip-hop to be you know obviously he sort of moves more into a a gospel slash r&b slash hip-hop melange which is great because it pushes the art forward but, you know, when I think of classic hip hop, I think Public Enemy every time, you know, Public Enemy and, you know, Black Sheep and, you know, that New York style hip hop, you know, and obviously the first Snoop Dogg album. Yeah, so I, I have three reviews from when the album came out that I think you'd enjoy and then we'll move on to uh, Army of Anyone. So Rolling Stone says it's a Molotov cocktail of nuclear scratching, gnarly minimalist electronics and revolution rhyme. And they complimented 
complemented its abrupt sequencing and violent sonic compression of rapid fire samples, slamming jail door percussion, DJ Terminator X's tornado turntable work, and Chuck D's outraged oratory. Then Los Angeles Times <laughs> commended Chuck D for his rapping, writing that he isn't afraid of being labeled an extremist and it's that fearless bite or game plan that helps infuse his black consciousness raps with the anger and assault of punk pioneers like the Sex Pistols and Clash. And then Q says, uh, it's an unimaginably urgent album seething with vengeful rage and booby trapped with incendiary musical devices. Q hailed it the greatest rap album of all time, a landmark and a classic. So that's what I've got for that album. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think Fear of a Black Planet, the album that comes after this, is almost just as good. Those are the two albums you see from them that are at the very top yeah. of classic hip hop. So Army of Anyone. So this self-titled album comes out in uh, 2006. We already mentioned that's the super group uh, with members of uh, Corn Filter and Stone Temple Pilots. Uh, so this album, uh, you mentioned to me before, you consider yeah. this one of the greatest albums of all time that nobody's heard. Uh, so it did have two singles, but they they kind of came out and disappeared. They thought this album, because each of the individual bands have gone yeah. multi-platinum, they thought for sure this would be a big multi-platinum hit. And it sells about 88,000 copies, which to a major label is yeah, nothing. And nothing. Um, wh <laughs> why... <laughs> like why do you think why because it, it's a great album why do you think it just kind of was was went under the radar um i really don't know because i mean they made the rounds you know um they played leno um i think they did letterman they did some touring right off the hop you know and they went and they went and they did like clubs like house of blues you know, there's some footage on the internet of them doing a show at the Masquerade in Atlanta, which is, you know, like a thousand seat venue. They came up to Toronto and did, uh, I think, two nights at the Horseshoe. Um, I know at the time, some of the uh, Richard Patrick was struggling with his voice because they they ended up, I think, bailing on one of the Toronto shows. Um. I just think there's a point in that part of early 2000s sort of modern rock or active rock where records are getting get lost, got lost in the shuffle. You know, we always kind of thought that like the Idle Sons record kind of got lost in the shuffle at around that same time when it came out in 06. And uh, this record felt the same to me. It to me, it felt kind of like a kindred spirit. Like it's just this really fantastic record. It sounds amazing. It's so it sounds so good, you know, and then, you know, you look, oh, it's like, oh, it's Bob Ezrin produced it. And, you know, and the songs are great, but I think maybe like they're not edgy enough for some people at that time where, you know, in 04, like you've had a few years of these bands and then people are looking to sort of push the envelope further in one direction or the other. And uh it's also an incredibly artistic sounding record, you know, like um, the, the lead off single was a song goodbye. It's like the only song I've ever heard on the radio that has a drum solo in the middle of it and a drum solo in the outro that goes on on the album for like four minutes, but it's just such a cool sounding band. And uh, I think also maybe people were a little reluctant to hear a band that sounded like the Stone Temple Pilots that wasn't Scott. Um, Scott. Because before this, there's another band that the brothers did called Talk Show. That's really cool too. It's more beatly, less hard rocky, but there's a single you can look up that's called Hello, Hello by the band Talk Show. And it's the DeLeo brothers and Eric, the drummer from Stone Temple Pilots with a different singer. And it's the same thing. It's this incredible sounding record that like nobody bought. And the Army of Anyone record, I feel is like it's the same thing. But for me and like for my friends that were really into it when it came out, it was like the secret that we had that like nobody knows about. And uh, to talk maybe about the the, the how, how, who this record ended up reaching, um, literally three days ago, I was in catering on tour on the Disturbed tour. And uh, the drummer of Disturbed was talking to Joe, the drummer from Theory of a Dead Man, 
about like favorite records and he brought up this album and i actually stopped the mid conversation i was like wait you like army of anyone i'm bruce by the way that's awesome <laughs> like nobody knows about this record and he was the same way he was like i know no one has ever heard this album and it's so cool and you know like the songs like you go the first three four songs just like seamlessly kind of all fade into each other and it's like just this one great experience and obviously as a bass player or a retired bass player like robert's playing on it robert de is playing on it is like unbelievable you know and obviously ray and i feel like probably dean and richard probably don't get enough kudos for what they do on the album i mean i th- i really think it's probably richard patrick's most interesting vocal performance compared to especially because like uh, the third filter album the amalgamate came out like just before this which is you know 45 minutes of richard patrick yelling at you which is awesome by the way i don't want uh, you can't swear in this show right or you shouldn't swear you can say whatever you okay. want it's that record is fucking dope you know it's like uh tom lord algae mixed it it's like super it's super duper compressed but it's like just guitars on top of guitars on top of guitars on, like there's so much guitar in there and the drumming is fantastic and you know so for him to go from that record which is very very aggressive and you know very you know i wouldn't say linear but definitely focused into this army of enemy one record where you know i didn't know he could sing like that you know which i th- I think is awesome. It's just, yeah, it's another record that I probably, if you gave me the time, I would not stop gushing about. So 04 to 06, I think that's like the peak of like the illegal downloading and the Napster and like iTunes finally comes out. And do you think that maybe that had to do with it is it was at the Um, peak where maybe people were getting excited about, Hey, I can actually access this for free. And that affected you know, the, the sales on your album, Idol Sons, around that time and this album? I think for a band like Army of Anyone, because it didn't really feel like it got, like, a huge push in popular media. You know, like, you didn't hear a ton of it on the radio. You didn't hear, like, pe- it wasn't a record people were, like, really talking about as much as I thought they would be. Um Definitely, I bet you there's probably a million copies of it on people's old hard drives and the computers in their basement. Um, But it definitely felt like it just didn't get that push, you know, like that's also around the time where like sync licensing and like video games and stuff is really, really starting to get really important. I don't think it's on any video games because I remember like the first place I heard Seven Dust was like ATV Off-Road Fury on PlayStation 1 or PlayStation 2. You know, and I I don't think it got synced to anything, but man, you know, the first the just the the first song on that record, like it's just such a great opener, you know, lyrically and the bass playing, like and the drumming, everything. It's just such a killer song, and it wasn't a single. Which yeah, is I mean, crazy I mean, easy to me. You know? If you're thinking of super groups around the same time you have audio slave and yeah. they go on to sell millions and millions and millions and have all these hit singles and all these albums and you're like well both of these groups are great and both of their the music for both of them are great like why is why did this one blow up and this one you, you know this was army of anyone's only album and it has to be yeah. because of the disappointing album sales that they're like well we can't green light anything after this yeah, I imagine there was probably a lot of consternation with some guy in, in an office on a telephone. Um, I don't know, you know, because there's so little information out there about the album cycle and what went on. There's not a ton of stuff on the on like YouTube. If you're looking for live performances, there's not very much out there, you know, and I definitely would not have worked up the courage to ask, you know, in my one opportunity to meet the brothers. Um, I probably definitely wouldn't have asked, even though I like that record probably almost as much, or if not more than I like the first STP album, which, you know, if you were, you know, if the list was expanded to the top 10 core would be in there for all the same reasons why I love the army of anyone record. But yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, maybe, you know, I don't want to speculate, but I don't think it's fair. 
Yeah, life isn't fair, is it? Especially not in the music industry. But if you were like a betting man and you looked at this and you're like, okay, there's members from from multi platinum Stone Temple Pilots, multi platinum band Filter, multi platinum band Corn, then it's produced by Bob uh, Bob Ezrin, who did Pink Floyd's The Wall. He's done uh, Alice Cooper. Uh, he's he's done. Um, who else do we have here? Uh, we have Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> Did, Pink, did Bob do Dark Side, Dark Side of the Moon? Uh, he, no, sorry, he, did, he, did. he did one of those two big ones. It was yeah. either The Wall or Dark. I think it was The Wall. And then he, he did also Division did, uh, Bell and a, a third Pink Floyd album. But he's yeah. done In Kiss. more modern times, he did Deftones. He did two Deftones records, I think. Yeah, so it's like you have these amazing popular musicians that know how to make hits. They've already proven and great music and great albums. And then they're under the supervision of one of the greatest producers of all time. It's it, it it's like if you were a betting man, you would bet that this would be a, a successful album yeah, without even hearing it. And then you hear the record, and it's like sonically, it's fantastic sounding. You know, if you were to, you know, give me a blank slate and a million and like two million dollars, and said, "What does your perfect record rock record sound like? Perfect modern rock record for that era? That's the one." Like. The drums sound fantastic, but they don't sound, you know, they don't sound pedestrian or like every other drum set of the time. Obviously, uh, Dean and Robert DeLeo, the guitar tones are unique and interesting. You know, it just doesn't just sound like a Marshall with a 57 on it. It's like really not that there's anything wrong with that. It's really unique sounding. You know, the vocal deliveries are really cool. They're great performances. The the bass playing is a masterclass in modern rock bass playing, you know, right off the hop. Again, first song, listen to the bass part. It's so good. And it's like, it's one of those things where I definitely had a phase in my career as a bass player where I spent a lot of time wishing I could write lines like that with and make them sound effortless, you know. And uh, Rick Beato on his YouTube channel has awesome. like a hour and a half interview with Robert DeLeo, mostly about STP. I don't even think they bring up Army of Anyone at all, which leads me to believe that it might be a bit of a sore spot. The way he describes how he wrote these songs, you're just like, wow, it's just that easy for you, eh? Like, I couldn't imagine, you know? He was showing that, you know, they start as like a flamenco song and it's very cool, yeah. You know, just I like a bossa nova if, thing, and yeah, I would love if if the opportunity ever presented itself, and I could do it without being a complete puddle. I would love to sit down with that guy and have a chat about that record specifically, because no one know, no one really knows about it, and no one knows what happened to it and why it went the way it went. You know, I'm crossing my fingers, you know, and hoping amongst hope that you know it's some sort of Greek tragedy involving politics and record labels and not that like the band couldn't get along or something and that they were, you know, architects of their own demise. That would really, that would really suck. Maybe, maybe I'll make that my biggest goal uh, for the (laughs) podcast is someday have one of those four members on and ask questions about army of anyone uh, through, throughout there. Uh, Have have you heard about the the backstory of how these members got together and then I have no idea. I just know, um, one of our a r reps at EMI gave it to us and was like, hey, this is a tour you might be able to get on. You should listen to the music and see if you'd like it. And like, just being like, um, Michelle, this is unbelievable. Where did this come from? She's like, oh, it's this band. Was, you know, they're doing this snowcore tour and they're looking for support acts. And we think like, maybe this could be good for you guys. And we didn't get it. I don't remember who did get the tour. I don't even think the tour ended up finishing. I think they ended up folding that tour up before it was done. But uh, yeah, man, like that record is something else. Yeah. So it it was the singer from Filter who was yeah. in rehab, and then you had Stone Temple Pilots had recently broken up because of Scott's yeah you know dr- drug problem. So you had both bands kind of in limbo with not much going on and um once the singer from filter started to get a little bit better uh writing sessions started to happen for the fourth album uh, the album after the one you talked about that was, yeah, the was really heavy so the fourth album so uh 
the singer from Filter heard that the brothers in Stone Temple Pilots were interested in writing at least one song on the Filter album. So when they got together, it ended up being like a 12 hour jam session. And the singer from Filter was so impressed with what they had done that he actually pushed back the fourth Filter album and the label wasn't happy about it because that's a for sure yeah. like million seller. He pushed that back to start this group. And that that's how it started. It was a writing session for Filter. So. That's that's great. That's those are the kind of steer stories you like to hear about records you like is that, you know, like this kind of came together kind of organically. And, oh, we did a couple of writing sessions and it really was, looked like it was working out. And so that that really makes me happy. And again, like that's such a fun, interesting record. And again, I th- I think it might be up there as far as like what you would want a modern rock record at that point in time to sound like. Yeah. The, I think it has great songs. Yeah. You've mentioned like the bass stands out and other things stand out to me. The drums uh, were yeah. just inc- like, again, right off the bat, the first song, I think you said there was a drum solo in there. And yeah, I was like, a, this a is, bill. yeah, this is incredible. So all the way through the drums, you know, and there's, great drummers on lots of albums but this one specifically it's like there's something so tasty about the drum playing on this one it was it was next level even amongst next level drumming on albums yeah and you know like ray luzier hadn't joined corn yet by the time that record was made he was i think he was just a session guy at the time i think he was with david lee roth on on some (laughs) tours (laughs) that's even that only makes it better right like (laughs) yeah but yeah, and again, like the drum sound itself is really unique. The way the tonality of the drums and where it sits in the mix, it definitely feels more like a, a driving force and less than a, a you know a supporting role. You know, it's one of those records, and it's a record that's got really great guitar playing on it. But I don't see it as a guitar-driven record. It really feels like it's more driven by the rhythm section. And, you know, there's some great guitar sounds and uh, Dean has some really great slide work in there. That's, again, kind of out of place for 04 in modern rock. Not a ton of guys playing slide. There's some really great slide work in there. And it's this record that, like, yeah, it just, I, I have a hard time sometimes putting my finger on why it sounds so great. Because there's so many great aspects to it. So two final things and we'll move on to your last album from Marvin Gaye. Um, Just like the the Public Enemy album mentioned that they were trying to do the hip hop equivalent of the Marvin Gaye album, tying two of your five albums together. We found a a common link here in this album. So I had no idea. No idea. Right. So this is very cool. So the this album from Army of Anyone was it had its original mix. And at the last minute, they did a, a different mix and the person that mixed it was the singer from failure, which ties together a different album in your top five. So yeah. um, Ken Andrews uh, from, from failure. So he, the only reason they had enough time to do this last minute mix is he had his own home studio with pro tools. So he just got to work, did the mix, yeah. presented it and ended up being the final mix the way that, you know, and love the album and love the sound. Which, so which does kind of make sense to me now, because I think, I believe he also mixed the first tenacious D album which is also just a fantastic sounding record. You know, if you listen to like tribute off that album, it's just this incredible sounding rock song. So that does kind of make sense to me. It's funny. I'm kind of embarrassed that I didn't know that. Cause like, I'm a pretty big nerd, especially when it comes to like production and credits and who worked on what. And not once in all the years that I've listened to that record, and I've been listening to it pretty constantly since 2004, did I ever look up who produced it and who mixed it or who engineered it or where it was recorded. I assume it was recorded in Georgia where the STP records were made, but I don't really know. So this is, could. if you have one takeaway from, from this interview, it's yeah. uh, that, that uh, Ken Andrews ended up mixing it. Uh, so I have, I have one positive review for the album and then we'll move on. So all music, yeah, des- there none. there's, there's just one, one person that liked it. So all music described the album as boasting sharply written numbers filled with dynamics, musical nuances, and a big sound courtesy of producer Bob Ezrin. 
With its mixture of moods, subtle use of genre shifting, and powerhouse guitars, Army of Anyone breaks down rock barriers. So a nice review that we wish led Anybody's to, some, fetch it to led to some some more album sales than it got. So your fifth and final album in your five fave albums of all time, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, 1971. Why does this album mean so much to you? This is widely considered <laughs> the greatest album of all time. And uh, let's dive into it. Oh, well, why does this album mean so much to me? Where to begin? Um, I think everybody at some level subconsciously loves Motown. There's really, I, I feel like if you love music, and again, this is an opinion, you probably somewhere have a soft spot for Motown. Um, how it started, I was kind of late getting into 70s R&B and 60s R&B. And it was actually Justin Nozuka, who I worked for, who was like always riffing on all this R&B stuff. And I was always like, wow, man, like, where is he pulling this from? And the other guys in the band would be like, oh, dude, this is Marvin Gaye. This is, you know, Edwin Starr. This is, you know, well, this is Lamont Dozier. Like, you know, this is Otis Redding. And then. It was awesome because it was sort of like a, re a musical reawakening for me in a, in a way, was diving down into a genre that I had no real experience in and learning about all this fantastic music and learning also to look at music from a different perspective as, you know, like, is this pop or is this rock? Is this rap? Is this metal? It's like, just, this is a great song. You know, this music, like, this album is transcendent of any genre. You know, you can be a metalhead and love this album. You can be a hip hop guy and love this album. Like, you no, know, you can only listen to classical, only listen to uh, Modus Mogorski and, you know, Paganini and still love this album. Like, it's just such a great sounding record, first of all. And then when you discover how the record was made, which is in the dirt floor basement of, you know, a semi-detached home in suburbs of Detroit by a bunch of guys who had, at the time were basically being paid peanuts and completely unknown. You know, it wasn't until, you know, like standing in the shadows of Motown where, you know, these guys all started to get their due, but, you know, aside from the incredibly important socially conscious message of what it means to come back from war and conflict and, you know, society and the way that division in society and all of those things you know is just this music that just feels so great to listen to you know and obviously as a bass player it's probably james jamerson's crowning achievement i know bob babbitt did play on one or two songs that went kind of uncredited because of james's drinking at the time <laughs> There's a very famous story about the recording of what's going on um, of James Jamerson being so drunk that he couldn't actually sit on the stool to play his part and they couldn't find Babbitt. So they ended up lying him down and he played the entire song in one take lying on the floor because when he sat on the stool, he'd fall over because he was so hammered, which is not also in no way an endorsement for drinking to the point where you can't sit on your stool but you know like it's just a masterwork of music you know yeah this uh it, it's crazy because this is marvin gay's 11th album so yeah. you think about like a long career he was already successful and then 11 albums in it's the first time he produced his own album so yeah. it's like he took it you know into his own hands saying i've been successful with love songs and other things. And he, he just said he got to a point where he can't sing love songs anymore with the state yeah. that the world is in with Vietnam. He was getting letters from his brother in Vietnam saying what was going on. And he just said, I can't go on singing love songs. And he basically just took it on to himself, produced the album him, himself. He told, um, he told the, the head of Motown that I'm going to do a protest album. And they're like, no, like we can't do a protest yeah, album. And I can't and imagine Barry Gordy had a, had a good response to that. Yeah. This was essentially like career suicide. Yeah. And basically what happened is they had recorded what's going on, just the song, but not the album yet. And 
even though they didn't have support from Barry Gordy yet, they they ended up sneaking out what's going on to radio. And it, it went on to be a massive, it went to number two on yeah. Billboard. And then they're like, oh shit, okay. And then it's like that gave permission to do the rest of the album and, and get it out. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, you know, like as a very young teenager, I I had, he since passed with my uncle Michael, went to Vietnam and served in the U.S. military, the U.S. Army and did two tours. And I remember going to visit him and asking, you know, like, what was it like? And he was like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you we're not going to talk about it i was like well what was it like when you got back and he he would say to me well go listen to marvin gay and of course like 13 year old me was like no but looking back on it now you know and i went through such a phase with this music where you know i would just read books like this one which is basically just a book on james jamerson's musical approach you know let alone you know how you know, horribly destructive his life became because of drinking and everything else that happened in his later years. You know, he, you hate hearing of guys dying penniless and alone. And he was definitely one of those guys that, that, you know, went largely unnoticed until, you know, the standing in the shadows of Motown documentary came out and all these guys like Bob Babbitt and Benny Papacita and James Jamerson became sort of more in the spotlight, you know, and you listen to, uh, I think, What's Happening, Brother. I think that might be the first song on the album. Uh, I think What's Going On is the first one. That's the oh, second okay. song. That's um, the second song, What's Happening. That brother. song opens with this, just this, the dirtiest bass line, you know, like, I'd sing it to you, but I just can't. But, you know, like, his playing is just so tasteful. And, you know, Marvin Gaye as a singer, there's just so much emotion and soul in his voice. And you believe everything he says you believe immediately you know and the the sonic landscape you know it's like when you listen to mercy mercy me and you can hear the xylophone in the background well i think it's actually a vibraphone but yeah it's probably a vibraphone some kind of phone in there yeah you know some sort of keyed percussion instrument like a xylophone or a glockenspiel i'm pretty sure it's a vibraphone and you know all that auxiliary percussion and auxiliary instrumentation that's kind of like just below the surface you know, again, like I don't really have a, a horse in the race when it comes to, you know, discrimination or or, you know, racial injustice or, or politics. I grew up in a very stable, loving household. So when I look at albums like this, I look at it more from the face of the music itself and less of the political side. And, you know, because I'm, I'm not an expert on politics or or the injustices of the world, of which there are far too many. But man, like Marvin Gaye could read me the phone book and I'd be like all over it, you know? And the musical arrangement underneath it that, you know, that really creates the environment for this emotion is like, it's spectacular. There's really no, there's no other way to say that this record is spectacular. You know, I don't know anyone that doesn't like this record. I don't think anyone in the world does. So I had heard this album many times over the years. Yeah. I mean, it, it 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 literally, when I look, it shows up on over 50 lists, like the big list, Rolling Stone, yeah. NME, all those. It, it's literally on every list of the, for the greatest albums of all time. And so I, I'd listened many times over the years, but this time it's like, okay, I need to listen to, to research you know what to yeah. talk about so i really listened and it's the first time all these things jumped out at me so the first thing is the whole album sounds like one jam yeah. session so you mostly hear marvin gay's voice right up front so yeah. it's this powerful voice delicious reverb on it and then a lot quieter is this band that's like jamming the entire yeah. album you know it's not like a standard like four note bass bass line no. it's it's like walking the bass through the entire album and if, if you if you listen all the way through it just sounds like a band that's playing and shifting through a, a full album and then it's yeah. done they act the songs actually all segue into the into next yes yeah, so, like, so high it's, high it's, it's high in the sky yeah it's like one session so that really stood out was it sounds like one long jam that has a singer over top of the jam session. Yeah. Um, and also the bass. I never, 
you know, I'm familiar with all the songs on the album, but I, I've never, you know, clued into the bass. But listening with the good oh, headphones, yeah. it's so good. Bass is going through the entire album, and it's so unique and so funky and so tasty. Uh, yeah, that that, and, that really stood out. And that's really the cornerstone of like almost all modern rock bass playing. If it's a finger finger style player you could draw usually a, a straight line directly back to this record. The bass playing is phenomenal. And one of my favorite things you were talking about, the sequencing, uh, when they go from flying high in the sky into Mercy Me, the key change, right? There's just this instant lift, right? They're kind of segueing out and segueing out. And then Mercy Me starts and the key change just, you know, it goes up, I think maybe only a semitone or maybe a whole tone. But the key, there's just this instant lift as you go into the song, like, oh, I need to pay attention. You know, you're even like, I find myself like rising out of my seat a little bit every time. And then it's like, oh, okay. Like, what a masterstroke. Like, everything, there's no part. It's hard to spend time talking about how good this record is because everything on it is perfect. And this this was actually a groundbreaking album on the charts because, uh, Marvin Gaye with the three singles on this, the the first three singles on the album, he became the first male solo artist to, to chart three top 10 singles on the Billboard Hot 100. So, you know, people, Bruno Mars, people like that nowadays, you know, Eminem, they do that. Drake, the, Drake will have in the top yeah. 20 songs, he'll have 17. Like that's what happens with streaming now. But back in the day, Marvin Gaye, yeah, it was this un- was the unheard. first time he had three songs in the top 10, uh, which was groundbreaking. And I, I reference Rolling Stone's 500 greatest albums of all time list all the time. I'm always referencing yeah. that. This is the number one album on that list, period. Yeah. So it's not it in the be. top 10, in the top 500. It is number one. Rolling Stone considers it the single greatest album in human history. Yeah, and it should be. It's never boring. There's no point in that album where you're like, oh, all right, like, let's move on. You know, if it's a, even during the little segues in between songs, you're like, I wonder where this is going. You know, like you want it. It's a record that makes you want to listen to it more every time you hear it. Every song with every song that goes by, you want to listen to the next song more and the next song more and the next song more. It's a, uh, yeah, it really is. You know, it is when people throw around terms like masterpiece, or, this is a masterpiece. And whatever dethrones it, it'll, you know, I hope it actually earns it. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, I, I agree with the statement that it's probably the greatest record ever made. So I have one one final point and then we'll wrap up. So yeah. the start of the song, what's going on, there's kind of that famous saxophone riffing. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, there's this famous backstory that that wasn't supposed to be there. Like it's such a random, you know, a song starts and there's this kind of saxophone for a bit and then there's vocals. Like it's just strange, a strange intro. And the story behind that is the saxophone player thought they were just recording a demo and they were just warming up and he just plays that, that part. And then, um, and then Marvin Gaye was like, oh, what was that? That was amazing. He's like, oh, that was just me goofing around. And he he says, there's this line, I want to read it so I don't mess it up. Uh, so so the sax player is Fontaine. He said, you know, I was just goofing around and Gaye being pleased with the result replied, well, you goof off exquisitely. Thank you. And they kept it as that was the start of the actual song. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the other things that makes this record, the achievement so great is, you know, the environment and the time and the equipment in which they recorded it with, you know, like this was the record that was recorded in, you know, a dirt floor basement of a house, you know, with minimal technology, you know, there's no punching in or punching out or you're not even able, I don't even think they're at the level where they are doing tape edits, you know, like I think maybe it was recorded to eight track, you know? And I mean, in 71 or 70, like, there's not much more like I think maybe they may have gotten to 12 tracks by then, but this is like a 10 piece band with a vocal, you know, like most of it going live, you know, and backing backup singers, you know, some lights, some a small string section, horns, two drummers, a multi percussionist bass, two guitarists. 
it's unbelievable you know and like they did it in like a heartbeat yeah so let's uh let's as we wrap up i have three final questions so let's let's i'll try and do them quickly so no that's all good so let let's give all your other favorite albums a chance to shine so outside of those top five what are your other honorable mentions? You can name as many as you want. Just albums that our <laughs> listeners should go check out. Add it to your, your Spotify playlist and dig into these following albums. Obviously, Led Zeppelin 2. Because it's probably the greatest rock record ever made. Oh, Led Zeppelin 1's got more of a punk feel. Led Zeppelin 2 feels a little more polished. Um, The Deftones White Pony. Um, I'm trying to think about like multiple different generations. Um, just any albums you love anything that comes yeah any albums i love i love a lot of records man i got a couple thousand cds still um clutch the band clutch they have an album called uh robot hive exodus there's actually there's like a trio of really great clutch records clutch is like the great american rock band that people don't that not as many people know about that should um robot hive earth rocker and book of bad decisions are all killer well, um, obviously everyone I've ever worked for, which is one of the great things about working for bands is like you learn to, you might not love a, a song or an artist and then you go and work for them and you hear it and you listen and then you listen and then you really listen and then you learn, you know, different things about different people. Um, more modern, there's a band out right now called Sleep Token that everybody is freaking out about. Yeah, Rich oh. Beto from Finger Eleven. Yeah, Saint I know Rich was talking about. I saw Sleep was, Token last yeah. year at Download, and it was one of those things. Um, one of my coworkers in theory is a guy named Alec Eitram, who's also a recording engineer who works out of a studio in Los Angeles called Black Box, and he's really good friends with the guys from like Periphery, and um, he's like a few, quite a few years younger than me, and he kind of has his finger on the pulse of like all the new stuff that's really interesting that's coming out. And that was a record that he was like, we were working uh, the show at download and he was like, Oh dude, sleep, sleep tokens playing the second stage at like 4 PM. We should go. You should go like, you should go. And I was like, I don't know. I don't want to hear some like weird proggy metal band. He's like, no, you should go. And it was definitely one of those experiences where it was like, wow, like this is a type of, music that i have not heard before but i have heard in some ways it's reminiscent in some ways of early perfect circle but not really it's got elements of real prog and bands like periphery and it's got elements of more post-hardcore and screamo but it's also very romantic and it's melodic like, right and extremely melodic and the drummer is a monster isn't he oh yeah well, that's the thing and he's got this r&b gospel drummer who's just like all over it you know some would say you know i'm sure like the average rock producer would be like okay like maybe you're overplaying a little you know what it's sorry Man, i gotta it's cut you like off because so good. it when i listened to it a part of me do you remember the drummer at the wrong gig the viral yeah. video it oh, reminds yeah. me it's like oh it's the drummer at the wrong gig but it works like he's he's yeah. he plays so much but you're like this is incredible like anyone else trying to do this it wouldn't work yeah it's, it's like so some of the songs feel like a four minute drum fill that has guitar and vocals in it but to see this guy live like he is unbelievable and of course he's like nameless and faceless and you know just this guy in a cloak with a mask so you have no idea who this dude is and I'm, I'm obviously i'm a huge fan of mastodon um crack the sky is probably the heavy metal version of pink floyd that you wish you knew it's i mean uh remission is great Every other record they made is great. Remission Blood Mountain is the first one. Blood Mountain's fantastic. Um, so I, I just saw a Crack list. This guy is amazing. I, I just saw it. a list of the ten best uh, prog rock albums of all time, and I've yeah. been listening to them one by one. And Crack the Sky is on there. So yeah, it's great, man. Um, that one I really love. All right, I'll I'll, I'll ask one one different one is records. One different one is. Do you have any favorite albums? that our listeners would not expect you to love so maybe you know something pop or something you know less heavy that we wouldn't expect that you just love um i uh 
I'm always really impressed in the songwriting, engineering, and sonic quality of Pink. I mean, go. if you go see Pink live, she's actually a rock singer in a rock band that happens to write pop songs. Yep. But she's unbelievable. You know, everybody knows it. Um, other records I really like, um, the record by a kind of more obscure artist um, called, I think it was called Into the Wild by LP. Well, that was one that Ian Thornley showed me uh, one night. He's like, oh, dude, you got to listen to this. It's unbelievable. That's so the really artist cool. is LP? Yeah, just the letter L and the letter P. Just like incredible vocal range. Um, I'm a big 70s blues nut. So all the Kings, most especially Freddie King, who's probably the least known of the Kings. He has a record called Getting Ready, made in like 72, 73, that was produced by Leon Russell. That is super cool. Um, I like a lot of R&B. Um, I like classical music um great gate kiev uh, mcgorsky is i'm a big mcgorsky guy i like uh paganini was more you know vocal um i really like uh I'm trying to think here uh, there's so many i really 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 like um shostakovich dmitry shostakovich um he has a song called The Fire of Eternal Glory. Um, this is classical composer. It was written, uh, I think, in the 60s to commemorate the lives of the Soviet soldiers that died in the Second World War. Um, it was readapted for use to honor the firefighters that died in the Chernobyl incident in 86. But it's a fantastic piece of music. Um yeah, because I was in like a concert band in high school and um, marching band as well. So I do kind of have a, a, a spot in my heart for stuff like Alfred Reed, um, Sir Alfred Reed's Crown Imperial. And, you know, some of that March stuff is really great. Um, I try and listen to different stuff. I mean, I feel bad because I'm pretty disconnected from what hip hop is now. Because I'm still very much mind in the past to, you know, Ice Cube, Dr. Dre, you know, that stuff. And uh, I also like folk music. Why not, right? <laughs> there you go. So we, we have a tradition on the podcast where the current guest will leave a question for the next okay. guest without knowing who it is. And the question for you comes from a friend of yours. Oh, so boy. this is from Chris Cadell of Big Rec, who you've worked oh, with. I love Chris Cadell. And uh, his so normally I don't let the guests know who the next guest is when they yeah. provide the question, but I knew that he knew you, and I thought it'd be funny if he could cater it to you. So <laughs> uh, Chris Cadell from Big Rex asks, "Who is your favorite Arby's date other than your wife?" And then he says, "If you could swap positions with any tech or musician, who would it be?" Um, my favorite Arby's date, other than my wife, is obviously Chris Cadell. He said there's only one right answer. For this, so. <laughs> well, we all, on the on the big wreck stuff when I'm out with those guys, when I'm fortunate enough to be out with those guys, um, Chris is, like myself, a bit of a connoisseur in the idiom of fast food. So we often find ourselves joking, talking, conversing, sometimes arguing over what we think the best fast foods are. And I've always been a fan of Arby's because it's kind of like your grandfather's fast food restaurant. Like, Just roast beef doing, instead of a burger. Yeah, like, you know, like, I've never been to an Arby's and seen somebody under the age of 40 in there. You know, like, it's... I feel like it's where, like, when adults want fast food, when grown-ups want fast food and they don't want to deal with teenagers <laughs> except behind the till, you go to Arby's. Um... If I could change places with anybody. Um, any tech or musician. Any tech or musician. I mean, that's a loaded question. And I'm going to kind of partially answer it. Because I don't want to change places with anybody. Because I really like being me, even though I also kind of hate being me. Um, Talent-wise, I'd love to be as talented as someone like Chris or Ian. You know, as a technician, I'd love to be ta as talented as there's a guy with a shop named Nick Gagliardo out in uh, Caledonia. And 
he is so terrifyingly smart and talented. I wish I could be that smart. And he does it on the side, which is maddening because the guy works a regular job. I think he works for Kojiko as an installer and a, a, a service guy and then fixes guitars on the side. And I was introduced to him by like three different people kind of at the same time. Of, oh, you got to check this guy out. And I feel like there's nothing he can't do. <laughs> you know, like one of the real skills as a touring guy that you have to learn sometimes the hard way is that there are limits to your ability and you shouldn't jump too deep into the pool if you don't have a life preserver. And Nick is one of those guys where it's like, I look at him and I'm like, I don't think there's anything he can't do with an instrument to repair it. And, you know, like you just look at these guys and you, you wonder like you, I know how, you know, like I know how he acquired this knowledge through an unbelievably long amount of hard work, but I still wish I had that knowledge. But as far as around the whole circle, like, no, I, 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 I like being me again, even though sometimes I don't like being me, but I like being me. I've got it pretty good, man. Like I have a good life. I have a loving family, a loving wife that puts up with me. I got it great, man. And I have people like you for some reason want to know why I like what's going on. Life is good. Answer is a bit of a misnomer, which is everybody should like what's going on, but here we are. And can you now pay it forward, uh, providing a question <laughs> of the podcast for the next guest I did think without of knowing who it is? I, I did think of one, and I think it's going to be good because it's just vague enough. So my question is less of a question and more of tell me about your best worst day. And this stems back to all the way back to Idle Sons because we always t- joked about being the band that had the best bad luck, which is tell me about the best time where something really bad happened to you, but it ended up being a really good thing in the long run. Your best bad day. Same good in the long run. Sounds good. And, uh, <laughs> you, you know, schedules change, but yeah. uh, the next guest is supposed to be the original drummer from Stained. So John Wysocki. Oh, cool. Um, so you can see at the top here, where is it? Uh, there, Stain Break the Cycle. Break the Cycle. So uh, I, have, um, uh, I have that record. And I'm I a have massive, a massive, massive. Yeah, massive fan. And uh, that'll be episode 100, which is a big milestone. So I will ask Very John cool. that yeah. question. And uh, that's awesome. So as, as we wrap up, where can our listeners find you online if they want to stay in the loop? So whether social um, media. Well, my stuff pig has a social media account, but I don't. Um, he's on Instagram at uh, totally not Giptel. So if you want to live vicariously through a stuffed animal living vicariously through me, that's the place to go. Uh, I am on Facebook. If you want to look me up, I'm uh, I'm not particularly secretive. So. Hey, there, you, you know, there, you, there it is. There you go. And it's about as boastful as it gets. So, And for the, 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 the fans that have supported you from the start. So whether it's, you know, you as a, as a young musician, you uh, with idle sons, you with all this, the stuff you've done since then in the live event space, just the, the fans and friends and family and everyone that supported you over the years. Uh, do you have any message for them as we wrap up here? Um, I guess the message would be like, thank you for believing in me and for people who just watch these things out of more morbid curiosity. Thanks for listening for the last two hours or whatever it's been. Um, As far as the industry goes, um, I I think it's just more of a a real heartfelt thank you to the artists and, and the tour managers and the managers and my fellow crewmates that think highly enough of me to to pick up their phone and and call me if they need something or, you know, to offer work. It's very much a a job space that depends very strongly on whether people want to have you around as a person and, you know, um, technical ability kind of more of a second. So I'm, I'm very fortunate, you know, like I feel like I kind of know what I'm doing sometimes, but it's nice that there are people that are willing to take a chance on me and 
hopefully it's been as rewarding for them as it has for me. So as we wrap up here, Bruce, I just want to say thank you for the last two and a half hours. I know we always go, we always <laughs> go, go long because we have a lot to say and we're, uh, we're big, I don't big, shut up. no, we're big music nerds and I have lots of questions. So uh, thank you for, for your time. I want to say thank you for the five albums that you shared with me. It was awesome to right. really listen to them, to dig into the music, to dig into the info behind the albums. I appreciate it. And hopefully our listeners uh, will now go and check out those albums. Maybe the army of army of anyone album one, up back on the charts because of our yeah, push that us, to eighty one thousand units, buddy. Yes, and us, <laughs> us promoting it. So, uh, Bruce, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Of course, I also forgot one last thing. My favorite album of all time is obviously the one that I made. <laughs> there you go. So go check that out, Idol Sense. So uh, yeah, my Bruce, last Sokan check was a dollar and thirty five cents. So we're still in it, baby. There you go, ice cream, baby. That's uh, make, making them dollars. I love it. So <laughs> to uh, to the to the Bruce fans, the Idol Sun fans, the fans of all the the uh, bands that Bruce has worked with. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode. Take care, Joel. Thanks, buddy. If you've enjoyed today's episode of the podcast, please take a moment to subscribe, like, comment, and share. What I want to know is who would you like me to sit down with next for a two-hour deep dive interview? You can let me know by reaching out to me on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J-O-E-L. And you can find me on Twitter and Snapchat at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message. And I'll see you on the next episode.